The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this Michael. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on sexy, sexy, haunted, uh, naked, greased up hill uh, podcast. This is uh, Gav. Uh, This is uh, Dapper Dan, your love hosts for this Valentine's special. It's really weird then when I started talking, I thought I had a like that, like a sexy ghost in the room or something. Well, the kind of ghost that gives race dance a blowjob. I guess so. I guess so. And that's really funny. And kids, is, you know, I watched that with, um, I watched that with Elijah. I kind of looked over to see what he was thinking when, I, when he watched that. He did, obviously doesn't have any inkling of whatsoever. So it's I, funny, I didn't really, have a clue it? when I was a child what was going on. Yeah, it's like Simpsons as you get older. You know, those, the gags sort of change. You go, oh, yeah. Naughty. Anyway, welcome, you sexy, sexy, lovely listeners. Oh, we're deep in your ear holes. We are... <laughs> Right in there for this. For You're this making night. this less about love, more about so, lust. I, okay, let's stop that now then. Um, love, Dan. Tell me about your love. <laughs> this is our love special, our Valentine's special. We do this every year. We try and pick a couple of movies that are uh, related to romance or love. One year we covered Fatal Attraction and Basic Instinct. Relationships gone wrong. Um, I think last year we did Double Date. That was brilliant. I'd never seen it before. You you selected that one. One um, year, one year I I put on the music for the Valentine special. I put on the Serbian film uh, soundtrack. You, you did indeed. <laughs> you are an awful, awful man. <laughs> but yes, for episode 132, we are we're doing a double bill of sorts. It's a Christian Slater double bill. Yeah. And he is a heartthrob from the late 80s, early 90s. Some might still say he is. Um, he was definitely, uh, you know, Mr. Everywhere at one point. Um, and I've still got a lot of love for him. He's been in some great movies. But we are covering uh, one movie where he goes on a stag do or a, a bachelor party, as they say in America. Yeah. And things just go very, very wrong for him and his buddies. And that movie is the proto hangover movie, as Alice watched it with me and said, oh, This is like a hangover better and that's very bad things from 1998 yeah mm. so that in ah. cin- i saw that in cinema so did i on so a did. date oh jesus christ yeah and it's really weird, go, yeah. it was okay but it was really weird because i was into queens and watching the movie and i kept looking at her and she was staring at me the whole time it's really weird did she have her um hole in the bottom of her popcorn <laughs> maybe uh, and the other movie that we're doing, another Slater movie, mm. penned by the one and only Tarantino. Yes, you know, it's got even got romance in the title, guys. It's true romance. A love story. Mm. Of uh, sorts. Yeah, a uh, really fun movie, but we're getting to that because that's going to be fairly epic because there's a, there's a lot of names to, to talk about. And as, as we record, uh, weirdly and scarily, aging me that movie turns 40 over the next few months yeah 40 year old film it feels so new yeah 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 definitely God. but yes that's what we're covering true romance very bad things Christian Slater and I've got my respect for Christian Slater because Gleam in the Cube was a film I knew you were going to bring it up I fucking loved I've got it on big big box VHS I fucking love that movie because it was just not nowadays you watch you go yeah but um yeah, for, for, I, for I, skateboarding uh, when it skateboarded because skateboarding wasn't like it is nowadays. It wasn't in the Olympics, that's for fucking sure. Yeah. You know, it was nowhere. No one had heard of Tony Hawk. And, nobody, back then. and so, you know, have, yeah, and he, he drives a pizza truck. Is he in there? Is he driving a pizza he truck? He's driving a pizza truck down the road with a sun visor, his hair coming out of a sun visor, like a real surfer bum. You lent it to me about oh, nice. fucking years ago yeah. because I'd never seen it. Um, it's and also, right. you know. It, 
it, also like, I love him because Heather is, is just an amazing film um, and I really love Pump Up the Volume um, and I loved um, Cuffs so he's done some great yeah, movies that, that, those three you just said I don't really know so much for me Christian Slater the, 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 I don't know he's done quite a good sort of films hasn't he all sorts really he's done some terrible stuff as well though like, he yeah did, he's done um, lots yeah he did some terrible horror films. He did that film Broken Arrow with John Travolta, yeah, which I'm was all right. That. Why are you now thinking what Christian Slater movies? I'm he um. Well, we can look at that when we come to the yeah, first yeah, movie. Yeah, do, one do. quick roll for his. But um, you know, the thing is, he's always seems seemingly has kept his nose clean. He's you've never and, and he probably didn't, if you know what I'm saying, in the day back in the day. But he um never really has been in the public eye. He's never he been in trouble is for a anything. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky lad, isn't he? Because he has got that pretty boy look. Yeah. But you know he's a bit cheeky and he'll definitely go around the corner and snort some coke. With, he with, is with he is a young Jack Nicholson, in my opinion. I, I always think how much like, he reminds Colin me Farrell, of him. Colin Farrell has on his shoulder a good and a bad. He, Christian said is like the good one. But yeah, but he's still got a little bit of bad in him. Is, is, is there? Is Colin there? Farrell sort of walks into a party and he's thinking, a ah, look check out all of these beautiful women over here what am I doing? a lot of drugs probably shouldn't get involved and then Christian Slater's like bing it appears and he says well you couldn't get involved but then you could also get involved a little bit Colin and go like that and who's the good one then who's the bad one then um don't know I'll okay. be Weinstein <laughs> Colin, Colin Farrell and, and Christian Slater both have a kind of cheeky handsome young look where how, where's Weinstein coming to this I just don't I don't, I don't see that in the uh, trifactor <clears throat> anyway it is I love special yeah so. welcome uh, everybody if you're here for love you're at the right place that's for sure <laughs> as you can tell just like I once saw written on a bathroom wall if you're here for love you're at the right place going back to the glory hole from the last episode we should open up on Valentine's special like open up the phone line and just get the get calls coming in and giving us their uh, uh, their woes in romance so we can then give them our uh, insightful uh, knowledge and wisdom of the I love found, I found my husband wanking to dwarf porn <laughs> That's the whole thing. I'm not going to go into Dan. Don't don't tempt me into these uh, alleyways Dark. of dwar dwarf little people. Dwarfism. <laughs> alleyways of dwarfism. A new album coming soon. Um, okay, people. so as always, Gav, I'd like to start the episode by telling you I love you. Oh, I love um, you too. Um, it's absolutely fine for two grown men to say that to each other. Everyone should say it to everybody. It doesn't matter who you we are. We all love you, listeners. We love you, listeners. We love you, patrons. We love everybody. Mm -hmm. But yes, I hope you guys feel the love from this episode. Uh, I also love my wife very much. Uh, I also love my uh, my lady, Sarah, very much. We were discussing off air, just before we recorded, how lucky we both are, genuinely. And they don't... Well, actually, Sarah listens to this, but my wife, Alice, doesn't. But we, we, you know, we are very, very lucky. In fact, I said to Alice on Valentine's Day... That she made me believe, and this is a bit soppy now, she made me believe in true love because uh, I feel like me and her have got true love. If that is such a thing, I feel like well, that's what we've got. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, well, we, uh, we have both had this discussion, not me and you, me and Sarah, and uh, same same thing as well, yes. Oh, so we're lucky, and we hope that you guys are... And it, but if you haven't got anyone to love, love yourself. Twice a night, I recommend. Mm, definitely. Cool, so, wow. Uh, I'm like a doctor. <laughs> Twice a night, I recommend. Um, and if you need a hand, give me a call. Doctor, um, should I have Kleenex in the <laughs> in the bedroom ready or just into the sheets? Well, it's up to you. If it's wash day the next day, just use a sock. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to kick things off. I'm going to take us back to 1977 because I'm going to tell you what I've been watching, as you are as well. Um, I watched a film that was recommended to me by somebody else I love that where's, we love. Where's the 1977 come from? Because it's the film is from 1977. It's the year I was born. There we go. Um, what a lovely year that was. Love. So uh, somebody else that we love is our good buddy and podcaster, RJ McCready. I do a show with him called Blame It on the Aliens podcast. Absolutely. And he recommended to me a film I'd never seen before from 1977 called The Uncanny. Peter Cushion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very good film. One of these sort of three stories in one movies that were very popular at the time all about cats taking over the world 
Um, well. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Um, can't recommend it enough. And it's on YouTube. So I'd highly recommend you watch it, guys. If you like cats, or if you hate cats more specifically, uh, Peter Cushing does in this, then you will love The Uncanny. I think I've seen that with Sarah, actually. She's, she, she hates it when I can't remember anything. Well, as long as you remember her name. Now, what have you been watching? Come on, hit me. <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping onto a IMDb to her. So it's going, to, oh, I'll tell you what. Sarah and I, funny enough, had a bit of a, a 70s, 60s, 70s weekend. Um, one I quite liked was The Devil's Men on... Um, I watched that yesterday. YouTube, which also known as uh, Land of the Monitor. Yeah, I watched it yesterday. Cause it's on Netflix as well. Gre- Greek horror. I've not really watched much Greek horror. Yeah. I really liked it. It's been on my watch list for a couple of years. Oh, really? and uh, I keep meaning to watch it, but I, I, as I'm such an OCD, I wait until they come to come around on the list. Um, I never really bump things up too often. But because it had jumped on Netflix, I thought, this is a good opportunity, really. And I've been off this week cause my kids have got chicken pox. So while they were having their nap, I popped it on and I watched it on Netflix. Um, what do you think? I thought it was shit. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to like it because it's Donald Donald Pleasant. Yeah, of Donald Pleasant's done a lot of things. Peter, Peter Cushing. Um, and yeah, there was it's a good good idea. Um, I just find it quite boring, and the acting was very wooden. Uh, I loved the soundtrack, and I loved the idea of the cult. But ultimately, I was just by the end time it finished, I thought, oh, is that it? I quite enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. I don't why? Know, tell tell me. Tell me why you loved it. Um, I didn't love it. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. I just kind of didn't mind it. I don't know. I can't, there's nothing jumped out at me. Um, there was some sort of, some bits were quite good. When they went down to the bit where the monitor was, or, or you know, where in the under the tomb sort of things, the catacombs, yeah. sort of thing, they were quite cool. Some bits there. Um, but yeah, actually, we had a triple bill of uh, Donald Pleasant's films. Um, so we also watched Eye of the Devil. Have you ever seen that? I don't think I have. Um, recommend actually um, from 1966, and it's with Sharon Shannon Tate, um, uh, David Niven. Oh wow! Um, David Hemmings. Um Yeah, a few people in it, and it's basically. Let me read the synopsis. It's quite good. It's in black and white as well. Um, workers employed at a French vineyard quietly follow old pagan rituals that call for the life of the marquee owner to save his crops during dry seasons. So, Love it. Uh, so a uh, Wicker Man esque in the is it a bit, Is it a bit folky, horror y? Yeah, a, a bit. It's kind of set in like a castle. Um, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's worth rec- it's a, a worth um, checking out. It's a recommend for me. It's on YouTube as well. Um, a, a real good quality copy. Um, so yeah, that's worth watching actually. So check that out. We what also, was your What was your third Donny P movie that you watched? Uh, Phantom of Death. Jesus, I've not seen this one either. Um, not as good. By, um, it's directed by Ruggiero Diodato, who died oh, yeah. in the Campbell Holocaust director. Yeah. And um, it's Michael York, Donald Pleasance, and Edward Fenesh, who we should know from GLO, is quite a sexy yeah. lady. Um, yeah, this was um, in Italy, a pianist suffering from the progera generic disease becomes distraught and goes on a mad killing spree, prompting a police inspector to investigate. Kind of like Phantom of the Opera sort of thing. It starts oh. getting more and more distorted. Uh, um, uh, not distorted, you know, fucked up. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, not too bad. Not too bad. It's a bit, yeah. Uh, the other two were better. Okay. Eye of the Devil was the best one. Yeah. I watched something I love watching. This is our Valentine's Day special, so I love sharks, Gav. You do love sharks. I love shit shark films. Yeah, it is definitely something that you really do enjoy doing. So I watched, and I've actually seen it before, but it was on uh, the Horror Channel, so I watched Ice Sharks from 2016. Okay. It's, um, every character in it is named after a character from The Thing. So it's, you know what you're getting with it, really. Um, the effects are terrible, but if you want to watch a movie about ice s- suddenly splitting open, even though you're on land, and a shark bursting out and eating you, then this is the movie for you. <laughs> it's just... 
awful, but I absolutely love this shit. I can't get enough of it. Um, there's, there's loads of those good shark films, isn't there? There's so many of I them. I mean, not, not good shark films. I mean, there's loads of those shark films. Yeah. I also, just very quickly, wanted to mention another movie that I've watched that I know. You're Sarah. If there's that many shark films, that means there's, there's, they're being watched. That's the thing. Yeah, of course. You're so many of them. people are watching them because they enjoy them because they're shit films. It's a bit of a thing, isn't it? If it's a shit shark fil- film, oh, there's going to be a, an element of... Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I know what I mean. I, when I watch a film that's got something shark in it, space shark, house shark, toilet shark, I know exactly what I'm getting. You know, shark exorcist. To- oh, yeah, you do talk shark because it comes out of toilet. Shark exorcist, Franken shark, drag... Uh, what was it? Dracula Shark. Uh, it's just so many of them, and I just think, bring bring them on. Give should, me more. Should we make one, do you think? I think we need more of a budget. I think we need a bigger budget. Um, no. But there is a bigger budget film. I'll go back to what I was going to say in a minute. Um, coming out, because Meg 2 is coming out, and Ben Wheatley's directing it, which is mental. Yeah, because Mark went for a test. I told you, Mark went for a test shoot to be a uh, uh, John Jason Statham's uh, shot uh, double amazing because he uh, looks so just he was, like him he was directed for the day by Ben Wheatley wow and that's a very good segue and that's Mark who's the main stormtrooper <gasps> in our kickstarter campaign for our new short from Deadbolt Films Sanctuary Moon Star Wars Sanctuary Moon yes we are I know I don't want to time stamp this at all but we are about 25 Doesn't days matter. When this is released, uh, say 20 days of the campaign left, if you've got a pound, a dollar, yen, francs, <laughs> euros, I don't know. Um, if you ha- can, you want to see Star Wars and a horror movie, that, please, or just share the, share the campaign to your friend who loves Star Wars. Because it, um, it's going to be so much fun. But we're, we're a third of the way there in the fund. But yeah, if you can. But you've got to come check out what we're doing. It looks really cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting stuff. We're making a Star Wars film. I know it's a fa- obviously a fan film, and um, yeah, and it's a short. But whatever, it's uh, it looks quite good though. Like from just from the test shoot, you know. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. Yeah. So we're doing that anyway. Um, so that's a little bit of a segue to uh, that. But yes, Meg Two, I think would be uh, will be good, and I can't wait to watch it. To be honest with you, and I'll probably go to the cinema. I didn't like the first one, but I've only I, seen I it once. So I'm gonna rewatch the first one uh, probably. Valentine's, I love it. Now that's weird that I don't like the first one because it's got Jason Statham and a shark in it. I've I've got a two DVD. things I have great passion the, for. Me and the kids have seen it multiple times. Hmm. I will watch it again. I think. Next to Jaws, is the Meg. Fuck off. Uh, no, no 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 no. In my family with the kids, watching oh, okay. movies, a shark movie. I understand. Yeah yeah yeah. If we were going to do Jaws, but we'd seen Jaws recently, we go. I'd be like. I'll put the Meg on it, and Elijah's like, yeah, fucking a massive, huge fucking fish dinosaur. Amazing, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, going back to what I was going to say about your Sarah, I watched the movie from 2016, which I'd never seen before. Again, it was on my list. You take, uh, you, I'm going to slap you, man. I'm going to say, take my girlfriend's name out of your mouth. <laughs> take my wife's name <laughs> out your fucking mouth. Big witty style. In West Philadelphia, slap. Um, yes, I watched a movie from 2016 called Anti Birth, which Sarah said is one of her favourites. Uh, it's got the chick from um, uh, I think I watched American it Pie in it, uh, I Natasha think, Leone. Yeah, I think Sarah and I watched it, but I wasn't into it because it was a bit body horror like. It's got a lot of body horror. A girl, a drug addict who does every drug there is, starts realising she's pregnant and it might not be human. That's as much as I'll say. The ending is completely batshit crazy, but you'll either love or hate the ending. I loved it, and I thought it was really good, fun watch. Didn't really see where it was going. The body horror was really making me... There's blisters getting popped. There's a lot. Basically, it's to do with the body horror that uh, women go through when they're pregnant, you know, all the swelling and the water retention and all that kind of stuff, but in, in an extreme level. Um, and it's fun. It's really good fun. Anti birth guys from 2016. I recommend it. So does Sarah. Gav, anything else you wanted to mention? No, not really. I want to get on with this episode. Let's okay, get, well, I've got, let's get sexy. I've got two more to what to say that I've watched, and then we'll do that. We'll get sexed up. Okay, apart from that, I'll be watching Family Guy and X-Files, and I, I go in between those two. 
That's all right. Because uh, I've not really seen them. I was just, like so much Family Guy, I've not just not seen. Um, and X-Files yeah, I'm up to date on the Family Guy. And oh. I watched an X Files episode the other day, and is it like about a sea monster type one, and it had Kolchak in it. Ah. Oh. And obviously, I said Kolchak was the influence of X Files, and he was in it as an X X Files agent. And Scully and Mulder go and chat to him. Interesting. Imagine yeah. if that, his name was Kolchak in it. Uh, well, they could, could have done it that. Still could be. I don't know. I think. I don't he, think so. he could have said there was one time when I was on a cruise ship and I had to fight a werewolf. You've got to watch that. Ep- just watch that one episode, guys. <laughs> Honestly, if you're ill, you're sick for the day. Just find the cold track episode where he's on a boat and there's a werewolf, and, and the werewolf's just throwing people overboard, nilly willy, Millie vanilla. Um, I watched. There's two more I wanted to talk about. One from 2020, which is a love story. Funnily enough, uh, and did not expect this one to do it for me. It's called Spontaneous from 2020. Yeah. And it's about um, a girl who's quite a cool girl, um, and she kind of meets a guy who's at her school, and they kind of fall in love. But as they get to know each other, a weird phenomena is happening at their school where people are just spontaneously exploding, and I'm talking absolutely graphic explosion of intestines and blood, and no one knows who it's going to be. It's only the kids it at the school. No, no, it's 2020. Yeah. Um, it's on, uh, I think it's on Netflix and Disney Plus now. Highly recommend Spontaneous. Stick with it because it's actually a really sweet love story as well. Um, I genuinely, like, I was like, by the end of it, my heart was like, oh. I, because normally with teens, because I'm 45 soon, I don't really. <sighs> teens just annoy me, is what I'm saying. But. <laughs> These guys were really cute together. The chemistry was there. But the fact that people are just exploding and they don't know why. And then the government get involved and they're trying to figure it out. And it's just this whole other... It's just a weird film, but really, really good and highly recommended. And the last one I mentioned... If is you're a 20... teenager and you're a listener, don't, please don't be offended with Dan's words. Oh, no. I love most teenagers, but not all of them. Um, and also, if you're prone to explode, do it somewhere else. That sounds really bad, actually, for our Valentine's episode. Explode somewhere else, not over me. Do it in a sock. Um, The other movie I wanted to mention, the last one, is from 2021. And this is a movie that could be paired up with Barbarian. It's called Superhost. And this one really knocked my socks off. It's about a couple called Super... Well, they've got a website called Superhost, a YouTube channel. And they basically go around different Airbnbs... And they uh, go to one Airbnb and things are not as they seem and things get worse and worse and worse. It's part found footage. Like, I'd say it's like 20%, 25% found footage, but the rest of it is movie. But it's got some really good violence in it and it just escalates. Very violent, very good, very low-key, low-budget. Is this the one you told me to watch on um, Shudder? Yes, it's free to watch on Shudder. 2021 it's Super free to watch Shutter if you have a Shutter subscription. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you've got a Shutter subscription, it's free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. But yeah, highly recommend Superhost. I know a lot of people put it on their, their top 10 list for 2021. I've only just got around to watching it because I'm so behind. But yeah, there we go. That's everything, Gav. Cool. So I think it's probably time to go Bring to Vegas. Bring on the love. Let's go to Vegas. On a little bachelor party, okay. get some cocaine and some hookers, and uh, see what happens. Let's check out a trailer for very bad things. The bride. You have to pick up the cake. Don't we have somebody to do that? Yeah, you. The groom. I bet you didn't forget the bachelor party checks. The best man. It's five guys, 900 bucks. The stripper's here. Excellent. This is Tina. The problem. A slip. I think she's dead. There are always options. You left a dead prostitute in the desert. It's a 105 pound problem. You can't do this. We've already done this. It's not working. It has worked. It is working. What have we done? What have we done? What did you do? Have you done this before? This fall. I'm I just turned your little pathetic ass in. I am not listening this way. I don't want you to. I want to know what happened in Vegas. Nothing happened. Nothing happened in Vegas. Some very good people. Ah! He's gonna take out my minivan! I got 
by doing some very bad things. We were very, very bad. Here comes the Wahoo. While you're at it, you know, just get rid of that dog. <laughs> Kill the dog? Christian Slater. This is a situation that defies judgment. Cameron Diaz. This is my day! Very Bad Things, a Peter Berg film. That ought to be about the end of that. Yep. Okay, so Very Bad Things from 1998. A prostitute is killed during a bachelor party and the attendees turn on each other as the wedding approaches. Mm. This is directed by Peter Berg. This is his first film. Uh, he did some TV stuff before. Um, he hasn't done much of no. I think the one, two movies that people will really know him for are Hancock with Will, I'm going to slap you, Smith, um, which is an all right film, actually. And um, he also did um, that one with Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx, Collateral, which, again, is an all right not film. Not too bad, and Hancock's yeah. not too bad. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's into his violence and stuff because Hancock is quite violent. This film is violent. We are going to spoil it. Both, um, as both, we always do. Both the films we're covering have quite a few named people in it. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, this movie's got. Let's run through this list, cast this very quickly. Um, so we've got Christian Slater, obviously, you know, in this. Uh, John Favreau is the the groom. Um, John Favreau, as many people will know, went on to direct the Iron Man movies and the Lion King live action. But he's an actor in his own right, a very funny guy, uh, teamed up with Vince Vaughn a couple of times. Um, it's also got Marv from Home Alone in it, Daniel Stern, yeah. um, who is really good in this. Um, the absolutely stunning Cameron Diaz is in this, in her prime. She is adorable in this. Yeah, I, um, I, I still, I'm, I, I, as hot as she is, I have an issue with the story. I wouldn't, personally, as hot as she is, I'd be like, I'm not going through with this life. Yeah, <laughs> like, she... You yeah. are insane. We are not getting married. Well, the word we're going to use throughout this as her character becomes more into it is Bridezilla, because, my God, she is... She, she But she plays it so well, so funny. Mm. She's got fantastic comedy timing. It, it, and, does, it does help later on yeah. resolve issues and you do need to suspend your belief your disbelief a little bit with this movie because it escalates and gets worse and worse all the way through uh it's got other people in it Le- like leland orser yeah leland orser's in it as well so leland orser i never knew his name to right now he always is unhappy in every movie he does look at his imdb picture i know he is like uh, the unhappy little brother he, of he's um one- dustin hoffman yeah, he's uh, he's one of the victims in Seven. He's one's yep. got this knob with the sheaf on it. Yep. Um, he, he he's one of the one of the team I think in um uh, uh Liam Neeson's team in um Taken. Oh, you might be right there. And um, he but he's always really unhappy. And he why is he so unhappy here? I don't know. Just an person. The other person of note is Jeremy Piven. Uh, who's the person responsible for killing the prostitute? And we'll get into that as we go through the the, the movie. Sex worker, we should probably say nowadays in 2023. Yeah, but they say hooker in this movie. They actually but, say yeah, cool girl. But they say the N word in True Maps, which doesn't mean I'm going to say I'm it. not going to say that. So there not we go, that. my friend. There we go. Um, and he actually came on board last minute, Jeremy Piven, because up until a few weeks or a few months before they were about to shoot, Adam Sandler was set to play that character no Michael, way. who was going to accidentally kill that, the prostitute during be... the coked up sex scene i don't know if that would i think it would because he i like it when he plays straight adam sandler i like him in mm. um punch drunk love and a few other movies i where... think he would be the wild cat or wild card almost to who might sort of go and do that from the way he is do you know what i mean at the party he'd be like the one with the big baggy shirt getting, yeah, come on guys like you know but he opted to go and make the water boy so dropped out of this i have seen it but um, i don't remember yeah, there we cool. go so that's the cast let's crack into the movie mm. um it's a it's quite a, a dark comedy if you've never seen this film do check it out if you haven't watched it we are going to spoil the fuck about it so you should yeah go watch it first um because it's you probably don't really know what what's going to happen if it's your first time watching this i really enjoyed it in the cinema when i did watch it I'm really glad you did. It's one of those ones that people haven't really heard of. He's a um, girl staring at me the whole time. <laughs> which was really off-putting. Maybe she was a bridezilla. She was a little bit crazy. Crazy, crazy. 
Um, so we we kick things off. So first of all, let's just very quickly talk about this fact. The fact this is a 1998 movie, it feels like that all the way through. I'm all for it. I love the soundtrack. I love the songs that they pick, um, and the way it's shot. It's just very 1998, and it's up there with movies like for anyone that's seen Go, that's got Casey Holmes in it. These other movies that were in. Um, set in vegas it's got a bit of mtv 90s mtv style to it but it works it works very very well and it's fantastically funny and dark like gab's just said but also i do think there's two stars of the show really are cameron diaz but christian slater just plays one of the most dark sinister characters the he, way that his he, face he's, changes he's always played that character very well hasn't he yeah there's the, definitely the sneaky there's, one there's a darkness to him in real life, I think, but in a fun way, <laughs> in a prostitutes and cocaine way. <laughs> we, we, we start up with uh, Cameron Diaz pretty much just moaning. She's his wife to be, just moaning, moaning about stuff. Yeah, well, we start off with the wedding. But, so we get the usual, here's the wedding, da 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 da, this is oh, what's going to happen. Yeah, because we open on the wedding day that actually happened. Yeah. They're all like dressed up and stuff. We're like, well, I thought we were going to have you know, the bachelor party. So obviously, this is jumping ahead to what we're going to get. Then we're going to have like a few days before, sort of thing. Yeah, and we get John, John Favreau is the, the groom, as I say. They look fucked already. They look, they look they're, exhausted. They look exhausted. They're both very Drums. nervous, him and his best man. Um, yeah. And we'll find out that this wasn't his original best man. He's gone through about three different people that were going to be his best man. We'll find out what happened to them as we go through the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, so the, Cameron Diaz is, is, where the fuck is he? He's going to be late. Come on. And then we cut to a few days earlier. So this is the scene you were about to describe. So have got to say, what, Christian Slater selling, selling houses. He's a, the ultimate salesman, isn't he? Yeah, he sent houses. It's like a car salesman as well, sort of thing. Really, this that whole having that little bit of a jib, jibber jabber, like uh, Mr. T would say. So John Favreau, uh, who I'm just going to call John Favreau, it, it plays Kyle, uh, and him and Cameron um, Laura, they're planning their wedding, which is very very close now. It's about a month away, probably maybe less, and they're having the arguments about: Did you send the check to this person? Did you send the, the check to that person? <laughs> and she's. Essentially, they're also saying you should change your friends. Yeah, I hate all your friends. What's wrong with my friends? This guy's weird. This guy's a pervert. Yeah, yeah get rid of him. And also, get rid of that dog. It's like, what? The dog? Oh, God, the poor dog. Yeah. The poor dog. Well, they argue about the wedding, and then that then turns into the real crux here, which is she's really unhappy with them going away with these guys that she hates to Vegas. And then it's like, do you love me? What? What? Do, 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 do you love me? And it's like, is, it, is this like some, some, some like daddy type issues thing here or, or, or motherly issue? What, is this some like, you need this love and but you've got to be in control, you know? She really plays so extreme. It's almost comic book, but it's good. It's really good. Mm, mm. Yeah, we cut to Christian Slater selling his houses. So he plays Rob or Boyd, they call him by his surname, but Christian Slater's on the phone. He's got a couple of people waiting to see a house, and he's like, hey, hey, I'm on the phone, off the fucking property. And they're like, oh, we just want to take a look. He goes, you do not step foot on the property till I'm on the property. If he was trying to sell me a house and he was that aggressive, I'd be like, I'm leaving. You'd be out there, yeah. But he is calling a girl, uh, a cool girl or a sex worker, uh, and he says, look, I thought I'd call you rather than go through the agency. Um, $900. I need you to be in Vegas, um, and then if you if anybody wants anything extra, they have to pay you. But there's no sex, just none of the dollars, just to turn up, and dance, and just be sexy. And then you can you might make some extra money on the side because these boys might want to get wild with you. So he's organising the sex worker, the entertainment for the uh, with the weekend in Vegas. And and, and this is this is why like a, a professional uh, worker of this capacity would probably not do this and probably say no. You need to go through uh, a middle person agency. Probably, hopefully, not a pimp. But yes, hopefully not a pimp like Drexel from our next movie. Yeah, that's all right. White Boy Day. I didn't know it was White Boy Day. Oh my oh, god, Jesus Christ! Oh, we'll um, get to that. Um, John Favreau actually turns out he works with two of the guys coming on his bachelor party. He works with um, his uh, Jeremy Piven, who's going to kill the sex worker, and he and Jeremy Piven's brother Marv from Home Alone. Mm. Um, 
they hate each other these two brothers but secretly everybody kind of hates marv because he's really weird he's got kids and he's boring and um <laughs> they just they, they just think he's really strange and they all they even confront him later on for no reason and say no one really likes you we just let you hang around with us but we don't really like you that much it's a bit mean really um but yeah so though that's the dynamic between those three and then we've also got uh, Leyland Dorster, who plays Charles. He's coming on the road trip with them, who Cameron Diaz described as a weird pervert. Um, so we've got a, a good little bunch of people here. And then obviously Christian Slater, who she really doesn't trust. She suspects lots about him and she has a lot of good instincts when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, Cameron Diaz calls. Uh, so they're on the they're on the road trip. Oh, they're about to go on the road trip. Now, this reminded me of my stag do this part at a moment because <laughs> <clears throat> because um, once they get on the road and they're all very excited and boisterous in the car and they're, you know, shouting at each other and smoking and having these manly, stupid conversations about sport and, you know, dick measuring competitions, basically, and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden he gets a phone call on, on, the, on the car phone and he's like, hello? And she's like, honey... There's a problem with the seating. Yeah. They haven't got the pads for the seats that we asked for. And you he's like, guys, to, guys, you, keep it down. Yeah, keep yeah. it down. You, you need to sort this out. What? But, but, he's what? like, I'm on the way to Vegas. We're gonna, we're on our way. I can't start. She's like, you need to make the phone calls. This reminded me of my stag do where we all met up at uh, Weatherspoons, which is a pub here in the UK, for breakfast in the morning and beer before getting into our minivan that we, we were all driving away for my stag do and as i'm about to get in the in the minivan alice called me and said dan i need you to go home because i think i've left my hair straighteners on oh yeah and i was like no 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 no! i'm getting in the van now i've got a bottle of rum just been handed to me and some weed brownies and we've got like a three-hour drive i can't go back to our house it's the other end of the city she was like no you've got to go back and check the hair straighteners and i said this to alice and she just sort of went Absolutely. Did you, did you go back? No, I didn't. I was okay. drinking rum and eating weed brownies and reading Spider-Man comics and getting drunk with my friends in the car. <clears throat> I, I don't know. That that car journey was hard for me. <laughs> I stared out the window and didn't want to talk to people for most yeah. of the time. You were a bit uh, spacey, weren't you? I don't, I don't like the weirdo. Get to Vegas, though. They arrive at Vegas and we get our most 90s MTV-style montage of them slow motion Reservoir Dogs walking you, you, down the you road you, there's a few movies with this you, you kind of need Vince Vaughn in one as well you know that sort of thing yeah, yeah. they're Will, all Will excited Ferrell maybe you know lots of drinking is going on there's lots of girls dancing they're gambling I love I love that just before they left when all the wives come to say goodbye to them there's like a whole thing you know a whole send off oh yes yeah. so one of them um, um Marv's wife videos them and says like say goodbye boys yeah. come back in one piece boys and then yeah, she yeah. sort of says to Christian Slater do you promise you won't smoke the whole way and he's like he's got a cigarette in his mouth and he's like I promise I won't smoke just, at all just like... after this though I can't believe it when um, uh, <clears throat> who is it <clears throat> who's the one getting married it's, it's John Favreau uh, John Favreau yeah, yeah. so Kyle um, I can't believe it when he rings wings up he's drunk what, what's to say Cam Diaz <laughs> he loves her and she's He's like, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, really. And she's made the whole plan of the wedding, the seating arrangements, as little small chairs and tables. And that's like, whoa, that is, like, you need some, you need to have a partner who has interests. <laughs> Not yeah. just, just that, that's too much, because when the wedding's finished, where does all that go? <laughs> like, it's like, quite... That's going to go on me, isn't it? I don't want that. It's quite a sweet moment, though, because um, that's, that's he, not... he plays drunk really well, and also he sort of says, I love you. You're my yeah, lovely... He's doing the like, drunk ring home, like, I love you. What are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> and she, she just says to him, go and have fun with the boys, but not too much fun. And he says, I'm going to go and have fun, but not too much fun. Bye-bye, I love you. And back in the hotel room, it's cocaine and, and 90, late 90s break beats. Uh, late nineties break boys beats. Type thing. They've got WWF or WWE, whatever it was, and on the giant screen. Cocaine and this is cocaine, where they also wee, make no, this is where they make smoking bongs look like it's a dangerous drug. Like you actually put a Jetson smack into your arm. The yeah. way they film the bong smoking, so like, what the hell? Like it's, it's, you're making that look dangerous. 
Yeah, you wouldn't jump up in the air after doing a bong. You'd slump back on the sofa. But they are doing huge quantities of cocaine, cocaine as well. Uh, um, whiskey and... Just and in. again, these guys play it so well. The conversations they're having while they're high on coke. I've been around it's, people it's, at parties we, like this. We've been all... We've been, this is exactly what happens. Yeah, and they're just, you know... I remember these. They're setting the world to rights. Marv... Drunk talking s- shit. Marv know. says quite a nice thing to... Um, uh, John Favreau in the toilet they're having a few whiskeys and he says to him you know but kids and he said kids are he says uh, I'm trying to quote it he says something along the lines of they're really important because they're the little trees and when the storm hits and takes out the rest of the forest what's left the little guys the little trees that's why they're so important and he loves his kids Marv he absolutely loves them he's saying to John Favreau when you get married and when you have kids you'll realise that that is where you know everyone thinks I'm boring but it's because I want these kids to be so they talk about kids and what what he'll be like what John Favreau will be like he hopes as a dad so you're having all these smash drunk conversations it's brilliant and then strippers here yep. in the door uh, apparently the exotic uh, dancer is here to take their clothes off Tina her name's Tina and uh, she arrives. The, the um, song that they play, because it is, like I said, the sort of the 90s Brady thing where you'd have it, it's kind of hip hop influenced a little bit, and it's got like a sample from something going over and over. It, there's, a, there's a line of a sample which is played over and over, and it's What's That Smell is the sample yeah, that, that's, that's played that. over and over and over. And it's like, it's, just, it's, it's not, why do you want to hear this while we're looking at this dancer? And the other line that's played over and over again, I think, is. It's just um, so weird. You're gonna get a, you're gonna get a, a, a motherfucking gut full of buckshot. So it's like from a hip hop record. It's weird, um, yeah, it's but they really play that. Music. But but yeah, I've written here Tina montage, and she gives them all lap dances. Yeah, um, yes. Tina does have her own little everyone, montage. Everyone's really high and really horny. They're all sort of leering at her. One of them's got kind of got that sort of Serbian film look in his eye. He's getting real oh, oh, He's sort of shaking there, and he's all ready for it. And he's like, oh, "I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it." Oh, and just grabs her and takes her. Well, to the just before that, she says to John Favreau, "So you're the one getting married? Come on!" And he stops oh, yeah, her and no, says, "No, no, 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 no! I, no, can't, no, I, I yeah. can't do this." So I'm, she's love... opened up the doors to say, "Like you know, I'm I'm up for having the sex." So yeah, um, Jeremy Piven, Michael makes the error of taking her to the bathroom. He's high as a kite on cocaine. Caveman's her to the bathroom. Not by hair, just over his shoulder and just takes her. Picks her up, takes her off. Um, And just starts getting naked. He's really excited, talking a million miles an hour in the bathroom. She's like, yeah, great. It's going to cost you whatever. How much? He says, oh, no, no, no. The guys said they'll pay for it. So, you know, don't worry about it, you know. And then he says... He's, he's so coked up. He's saying to her, I bet you thought I was a little bitch, didn't you? Yeah, but you, you're not ready for what I've got for you. Yeah, yeah. Look at my body. It's better than you thought, eh? So he's, he's given her the full-on cocaine conversation. Meanwhile, outside... Cocaine ego. Meanwhile, outside, back in the hotel room, they've got the the wrestling on, and they are getting into a big, full-grown men pretend, like we used to do when we were 10 years old on the playground, but these guys are doing it. It's a bit like, oh, these guys have not been set free for a while, because even, like, now, I don't don't know, would you do this? Like, there's a lot of of, uh, anger and energy pent up, I think, maybe from these guys. Yeah, my stag do was not like this. It was not. We ran out house. We walk, walk into a room and there'd be people. Oh, we're playing sort of the Master System or Mega Drive or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, I had a PlayStation One. Oh, we were playing Tony Hawks and stuff on that. Yeah, and then you doing that somewhere, then someone else would be in the other part of the room, like maybe having a drink or something. There was a bit of weed. There's a lot of rum and beer. It, um, it wasn't wild. No. No. Apart I from when I, I danced I on the pole. Keep... Yeah. Oh yeah. Apart from that time, that greased up pole hit your head when you fell down. Can, can, no, can, it wasn't increased that pole. It was a podium, wasn't it? That was right. I got on that little balcony, and that bouncer tried to kick me out because he said it's women only up here. And I was well, like, I was joking, but it's but my yeah, stag. Yeah, this is actually true. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, Charles. That's weird. That place because it's just full of like I look around, look around at everybody going. Everybody looks like they're fifteen. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really just strange. I don't like this place at all. I thought I was going to like it, and I don't like it. There was that man aggressively singing um, salt and pepper lyrics right next to us, really loudly. At, he was just there going. Push I don't it, know what song it was. It. I think it was uh, "Push It," and he was just shouting it at us. And I thought, "What is happening?" 
Um, anyway, Charles, the youth of today, I don't know Layla what Dorset, he decides it'd be a good idea to fall back and smash into a coffee table made of glass. Now, yeah. this culminates with, as he does that, and sort of stops everybody, turns around to look at what the hell just happened. There's another fad. There's another smash coming from the bathroom, and that is Jeremy Piven flying up against the wall. He sort of slips on the wet floor with the prostitute at mid-coitus, and um, her head is impaled on a towel hook. And he doesn't know, so he keeps going until he climaxes. <sighs> so he came into a dead lady. Oh, just let that sink in for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he looks up at her thinking, why is she just looking up like that? But they all, like, the guys outside, well, they all well, laugh. Well, no, they're just sitting there and he's just like, they've all just looked at the dude who's just falling through the glass and he's just like, yeah. ah, shaking, going, ah, because it's because of those fucking gnarly bongs he's been having. Those, stay away from the bongs, children. Yeah. And um, uh, he says, stay on the and they kind of goes, ah, and says something, they'll go, ah, and they'll just laugh. But then this fella comes out of the bathroom and he's like, oh, I fucked up. And one of them goes, ah, and he goes, oh, this is. Yeah, like, he's got um, shit. And they all look in. White dressing going on oh, with bits of blood all over it. C- contrast of colours. Um, yeah, they all spot the body. But as they walk in the room, the body is still up on the wall. And, and then, then just falls the to tile the tile breaks. <laughs> with a hanger, but it's still sticking in her head. And so it's good basically got, yeah, yeah, basically got a naked lady with blood everywhere with the thing out of her head just lying on the floor. That's, that's, you, you fucked up. So they start checking for pulses, and they argue. It's quite comical. Check, check the left side. It's not the left side. It's either side, you, you idiot. And they're sort of, it's sort of showing, you know. Well, we kind of know the dynamics of this crew as it is anyway, but, like, throw them into a situation, you know, throw anybody into that situation or crew or whatever, what, what would happen? Like, all of a sudden, they've got to decide, and this is obviously Slater. Christian Slater comes in, fucking Boyd comes into his, being, like, the runner of this, in essentially, and his bad yeah. ways. Um, but they've all got to decide what they're going to do. Well, they they all want a lot of them want to call nine one one, and Slater says, "Hold on, guys, hold the, the on." The dude that done it is a brother to the other guy, isn't he? Yes. So he's, they, he's Marv's so it, brother. There's more responsibility there rather than it just being the one person. Do you know what I mean? The other one's like, "It's your brother. What's this going? You know, you've got to." Do you know what I mean? So that that there's a more of a factor for them to have this discussion. Not, I'm not saying morally in any sense. I'm saying in the story of this movie. Um, but because of the brother connection, do you know what I mean? So a bit of backstory for Christian Slater. He's doing a lot of these sort of self-help groups where he sort of, this is how he's become an amazing salesman. So he really, really fully believes in his own ego and his own ability. He knows how to talk to these guys. Yeah, he sells to them. So he says to them, guys, look, this is what what we could do. We could call 911. Or... Or what we could do is, I called her not through the agency. No one knows she's here. Yeah. You know, we could. And then they're like, what? Are, what? They start arguing about the consequence. What are you saying? There, there's no option. And he says, bury her in a desert. He says, there's always options. So option A is the cops. Option B, we bury her in the desert. Now, who votes for bury her in the desert? And three, then four of them put their hands up. And eventually, mm. Mar- first of all, Marv's against this. And he says, look, this is a major thin ice situation here. It's the desert or the police. Vote. And they all agree. I don't know why. This is why I'm saying about suspend your disbelief. They all agree we need to bury her in the desert. Yeah. yeah. Because when it comes down to it, they would have at this point here have CCTV in the hotel. It's been CCTVs for a long time. Do you know what I mean? They're going to see a lady walk in if they wanted to and not walk back out again. Like, Like later on when a guard comes. Now, he gives a fantastic speech. Again, he gives quite a few of them during this movie. And he says, I'm a man who believes that the quickest point between A and B is a straight line. Now, at the moment, I can't see B, but I know that there's a line that takes us to point B. And there's a £105 problem. We don't see her as a person. We don't see her as a sex worker or a woman. We see it as a £105 problem that we've got to move. Okay? However... (laughs) What 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 a sociopathic <laughs> mental state is that to just be so like so like is, nonchalant you know, with that? I think he'd be like this without all that cocaine in his system. To be honest, I don't think that the cocaine probably does anything to him. 
<laughs> but all of a sudden, there is, unfortunately... A knock at the door. A knock at the door. And we get a hotel security. And they, Let me in. They, they, do, they do that thing where there's a knock at the door and you all just pretend you're not there. Yeah, we've all done it before. But he lets himself in because he's got a key. But then the red, red key card fob goes... And turns green, and the door handle opens. Hey, hey, yo! Do you not? Um, do you not hear me knocking? Like, something this movie does really well is tension, and uh, this scene is really tense because it, it's cool. Yeah, the bathroom door is a little bit open, so there's a body on the floor, but the, they're keeping him distracted. What are you guys doing? You, there's a lot of noise coming from this room. We've had some complaints, mm. and he's like, "Look, we are. It's a bachelor party, but we are winding it down. We are going to go to bed." He says, "Whoa! What's happened to this table? Someone's yeah. going to have to pay for this." Uh, <laughs> but they. A slip him like what fifty? No, it looks like a couple of hundred dollars. Oh, okay, um, yeah. yeah. He it's says to him money. like it's a bit more money, and he's like, he oh, says, okay, yeah. Not well, right. he says, I don't know what gets into you, gets into you people. And Christian Slater says, lots of alcohol and lots Gross. of narcotics, and, and he then says, he says, down with that. Yeah. He says, oh, because that's because he gives him the money, and he's like, okay, okay, well. As long as you're winding it down, that's fine. And then Marv even cheekily says, do you want to stay for a beer? And he knows he won't. And the guy's like, no, no, no. And he goes, hang on a minute. It's not, it's, he's just walking out, and they're all super happy, so they're leading him out of the room. So we're all as audience are a bit like, oh, because we we want these guys to get away with it. I know. We don't want the 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 prostitute, the sex worker, to be found by the security guard because we don't want that. We want these guys to go out to the desert. We want to see this as a story that we've come to see, and we're, we're quite happy with this. But this guard might ruin it for us as a viewer, and obviously our, pro- well, I suppose they are protagonists, I guess, even though they are essentially all bad guys, almost. Um, it's going to ruin it, and he sees what's he see in the reflection. He sees her on the bathroom floor, and he no. says, Oh my God, oh my God, get it, back, get back, I think a, she's dead. It's a spanner in words, but the fact that he just like, Oh my God, runs over there and says, Clear back, clear back, and he's pushing them back to get her air. She needs air, and like, he's so innocently, bless him. I know. Just and it's like, guys, hang on, dude. Think about it. I feel that she's she's probably going to be cooler by this point. But because Christian Slater is a soulless machine, (sighs) you see his face looking around him, weighing up. Okay, he's calculating. Like, what do I do? What do we do now? How do I add this into the equation that I've already planned? Pick up this corkscrew, and then you just hear him say, "Clear a path." And he just runs in there, and he just shoves that corkscrew into that guy's chest. Four or five times into the chest, but thing is though, it is a court. I know he is piercing, but it's not. You're not going to be getting much. You're going to be getting about one inch of sharp. Yeah. Pain. But, that, but that's what that makes much. that's what makes the next bit it terrible. It does it's... make it a bit hard because they managed to push him in. He almost fights his way out, but then they. Won't He's a big guy. Out. But yeah, they're also like five guys holding the door. And Christian Slater says, leave it, hold it, hold the door, he'll bleed out in a minute, he'll bleed this, out. Oh, but here that's almost a bit disturbing, like the sounds of him uh, crying in pain is quite horrible, it's like, it's like an animal dying or something, they, it's just a bit like, whoa, fucking hell, and they just wait for him to go, and then they just walk in and look in well, there. Towards the end of his cr- scream, Slater just says, just die already, you son of a bitch. He's pleading with them. But they go in there and we get this like bird's eye view almost of the room, and it's a, oh a my white, God. white bar, uh, white kind of circular bathroom, I think it was. And um, uh, there's two dead bodies and blood everywhere where this guy's been like fighting to like get out of the room. There's handprints, bloody handprints, and blood everywhere as well as the two dead bodies. So one of them's like, I'm gonna call the cops. And Slate says, "God damn it, you call the cops!" But, but at this point here, Slate is now like going, "This plan's gonna work so much is that I've gone and now." killed someone i'm now actually a murderer so uh, no this is it so he's like god damn if you call the police now i will put bury you myself yeah and at this point you've got to be like right he's gonna do that hit this guy it hasn't even taken boyd much to turn into a murderer <laughs> it's just, this this has happened and he's a murderer it's like what the fuck he must have been on that edge already he gives Serial another awesome... in the making he gives another awesome speech where he says, like, I want everybody... To... It's quite Tarantino-ish, some of the dialogue. He says, I want everybody to be cool. I'm going to lead us and guide us through this situation, OK? And you know what's coming. They go shopping. We get a shopping montage. It's, it's, seen it's this a clean-up crew montage through the DIY yeah. store. Everybody, you've seen this multiple times. We get... Um, they're buying buckets, a pickaxe, Then the montage shovels. of cutting up the body. 
cutting up the both bodies. Both bodies, um, sorry, and then putting them into he- bags. They're wrapping them in plastic. They're walking out with these suitcases, all with their suits on and stuff, and the bathroom's essentially then, like, uh, um, cross, cross and dissolved clean. into different scenes, but getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And then they drive to the desert. And, and they, like, one of them's just like, this is not, like, this is not right. It's not. It's sac- this is sacri- sacrificial. Uh, sacri- sacrilegious. sacrilegious. Well, they bury. They originally they bury them, and then Marv. So Marv and his brother are Jewish, and they they, they strong Jewish beliefs, strong faith. Yeah. Yeah, and he says yeah. this is sacrilegious. We put, need. Yeah, all the parts of the body have got to be back together to form the body. To Otherwise, you can't, can't rest. In, you can't rest in peace. So they end up having to redig up all the suitcases. But this is where the the the, the guy who I said earlier is always unhappy. Leyland yeah. Orser, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's his name in his Charlie? Charlie, he's there going, Charles. I've got the top half of his leg, he just, the bottom half of her leg. He starts just freaking out totally, and they're just there, just, uh, one of them's like, heads up, Christian Slater says, and throws a head at someone. And somebody's like, I've got a bit of a mix and match situation in this suitcase here. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> No, no, one, no, no one was, I've got a, I have a combo situation. Yeah, a bit of a combo situation. So they end up having to take out and identify the body part, still wrapped in plastic. And then you get this overhead shot. And Alice was watching this with me. She's like, this movie is brilliant, but so fucking stressful. And you see Very. that they've laid out the bodies. Yeah. Like jigsawed back together so then they put badly. Them back into bags and then they bury them together. So, yeah, oh, they, man. They, it's they, just... So they finish burying them and they are exhausted. And that, and then um, that, John that security Favreau. guard would be missed straight away. He'd been like, they'd been like, "Hey, guard, at the reception, I'm the reception." Dave, I think person. his name is Dave. Okay, it? Dave the guard. Can you go to room two three two? There's been a disturbance. All right. Later on, Bob. Hi, Bob, my supervisor. Hi, where's Dave? I haven't seen Dave. Sent him to that room. Right. Can you get somewhere else to go up to that room and have a look as well? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he would be found out, but for the fun of this. Well, they, once they finish burying them, they all sort of light cigarettes and stand there thinking about what they've done. And Christian Slater says, I am proud of us, guys. I'm so proud of all of us. We had a very hard obstacle in front of us, and we got through it. And I couldn't be proud of all, all of us here. But John Favreau says that I need to say a prayer, and I don't know how to pray. But he ends up saying a prayer, like, dear God, forgive us for what we've done, because we're fucking scum. Like, this is terrible. Uh, I just want to get married in a couple of days' time. This is awful, blah, blah, blah. They, they all look so on edge, though. The brothers are all arguing, um, and then they drive home. The, the, they got, we got the drive back to uh, the city. Um they get the car cleaned. They're all very, very tense. John Favreau calls Cameron Diaz. Did you sort the chairs out? He's like, the fucking last thing I need to do is sort out the fucking chairs. I've just killed a sex worker and a security guy. He doesn't say this, but she doesn't know that's what's going through his mind at the I know, time. I know. She, she, you're at that point, you'd be like, fuck off. Fuck the chairs. And then Marv says... Uh, no, no, there's a really funny thing, though. When you do go later on to the seat in the beginning of the wedding, if you pan down, the camera pans down, there's one person who steps out of the chair, turns around and is pushing the padding. Yes. And an I thought lady. that was a lovely little touch. An old lady. Yeah, that was a nice touch. Um, yeah, she's sort of uncomfortable, and if someone lends yeah, her a cardigan, and she sits on... discussion some... going through. I thought it was a really good little... little Again, that, that happened at my wedding, actually. We realized once they'd set the room up that two of the tables didn't have the correct decorations on them not that we gave a shit me and alice neither of us cared we noticed it no one else would have noticed it there were certain decorations that weren't on two tables and they put one of the tables in the wrong place um so the table that had uh some some close friends on it was supposed to be very near us but it ended up being very far away but actually worked out because the kids were on that table which meant i mean your kids were on that table as well which meant that actually they weren't if they they could be as noisy as they wanted and it didn't really affect the speeches or anything like that so it kind of worked out but i know what it's like when things don't always go to plan for the wedding but whatever who cares about seat padding at the end of the day you just kill two people (laughs) (laughs) so um while they're waiting for the car to be finished cleaning Marv says to John Favreau, "Do you think he was a dad?" Oh, they, they, they're at work. What do they? Do? They read the paper. This is like before we're looking at the internet and stuff. Well, we well before that we get back to the burbs and the wives are there with the video, the camcorder. Yeah, you're home. How is it? Is everybody happy? They, they look. They look. Then they have to go and get a suit fitting. They look bad. And they're all there getting their suits fitted. Cameron Diaz is going, oh, 
this one's too the collar's not big on that one's but and they're all sweating and they're all sort of they're all hung over they're on a come down from all the coke and weed and they've killed two people so they're sweating profusely she's trying to get them into these suits she is being a complete bridezilla Control she freak. hates them she hates them all as well but yes you're right back at work a day or so later find out in the dude. newspaper yeah. There's a missing persons yeah, story. There, yeah, there are two kids. His two kids just wanted Daddy to come back. Where is Daddy? <clears throat> yeah, so they start to have, a, obviously, that guilt thing. And, and they have a massive argument in the office. Well, they, this, talk- this is the thing now. Well, and one of them, um, it's a, a Daniel Stern, he just starts getting super paranoid. So he's at the petrol station just filling up with gas and just looking at people. And someone's looking at his car, but he doesn't know why he's looking at his car. But he's looking at the car because he likes the car, obviously, the minivan type thing. And then a cop turns up and he's just like freaking out and he goes to pay for gas and just falls over everything in this, the gas well, store. His wife says, super paranoid, isn't he? Get, get some twizzle sticks or whatever the fuck it is. Get some wizards. He's got two kids who are screaming, wizards, wizards, wizards. And she's like, can you get them wizards? And he's like, I don't want to get them wizards. I paid for a credit card so I don't have to go in the store. And she's like, go and get the wizards. So yeah, he falls over everything. He makes a scene, gets back in the car. And she says, did you get the wizards? They don't have any fucking wizards. Yeah, I've had those situations. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But I haven't killed people. I'm not paranoid from the from the cops. He puts his foot down to drive off and they crash into another car head on, breaking his wife's nose. Yeah. So, cut to the pre-wedding dinner. So, in America, there's a tradition of, uh, like, a pre-wedding dinner. I can't remember the name of it now. Oh, really? But, like, the night before, or very close to the wedding, everybody who's attending gets together. And you kind of run through the day a little bit but you also do some speeches and you have dinner together and it's before everybody gets wrecked the next day i suppose God, that sounds like a lot of effort yeah well that, that, so that's what we're doing here and um all the men from the bachelor party are all staring at each other they're almost talking with their eyes all looking at each other around but they're looking at daniel stern because they know he is a ticking time bomb of paranoia and he's twitching you've and... got to think boyd at this point now must be thinking well i'm gonna have to kill him <laughs> yeah, because if he's like that, I'm gonna have to kill him because he's he's gonna he's gonna fucking yeah. You know, and it's that whole situation. It's almost like the old sort of Hitchcock type story or something. An old story where like there's one killer and everyone we've got to keep it quiet. Then someone else gets killed. So I had to kill them because they were gonna talk. They were gonna rat you out. Oh, were they? Yeah, it's just me and you now. Oh, okay, cool. And then you don't know who's gonna get when you could get killed, sort of thing. It's that, you know. Yeah, it's totally yeah. Twisted um, thriller. Well, Marv leaves during the speeches and John Favreau goes after him and they all have a massive argument in the parking lot. Um, Marv says he's really paranoid and they basically say, look, my problem is my brother being here, the fucking murdering piece of shit. And they're like, shh, people can hear you. So they make Jeremy Piven drive home. They say, just go home. Don't come to the wedding. I think it's best for all of us. And if you don't want to go to jail, just go, just go. So he drives off, but have what happens in the parking lot jeremy piven in his well, car it's because he's just like well that that's it in minivan that's it i'm fucking i'm gonna tell him about that fucking minivan he fucking loves that minivan that's it gets in his motor and decides that he's gonna drive straight head first into the side of the parked minivan doesn't he however wow. marv gets <laughs> Daniel stern jumps in front of it and this is a yeah, hell of a death scene it's it's yeah but it doesn't kill him but yeah well, not straight away. Um, yeah, he basically takes out his brother by ramming him into his own minivan yeah. with his own car yeah. in front of everybody. So their wedding parties numbers are going down a little bit at a time here. Um, they are in the hospital and the cops questioning them saying, so apparently you guys were seen arguing outside in Christian Slayer. It's like, look, man, we're fucking grieving right now, okay? I these questions are inappropriate. He gives a bit of a good sort of speech, and he's genuinely crying. They're all crying because they're worried about Daniel yeah, Stern. They're, they're all, yeah, but they're, yeah, they're all freaked out though, boy. Um, just the whole situation. They have just they're wrecks, emotional wrecks. Then the doctor steps out in the corridor. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid he's critical, and he's asking for his wife. And they're just like, oh no. She goes Is in, this and a he deathbed confession. He whispers something to her. So straight away. So Slater, boy, he must be thinking, I'm going to have to kill her. Now, it's very clever what they've done. They, I put the subtitles on for this scene as well. They don't tell you what he whispers to her, but it looks like he mouths the words, I helped murder them, 
if you watch what he says, because you don't hear the whisper, but it looks like he says, I help bury them. Now we, I help bury them. But we know he didn't tell her anything at this point, because she doesn't know until she finds a note in a little bit of time. Mm. But then he dies. Yeah. Beep. So he's now left his kids. Uh, he's got two kids. One they, who's they need to say what, what he said, don't they? Well, they go they go for a, a, co- a coffee and some food to discuss their friend who's just died, Jeremy Piven's brother who's just died. And then he freaks out and starts just shouting, I killed my brother. I killed my brother, okay? I killed my fucking brother. You, I killed my fucking brother. I killed my brother. I killed a prostitute. I killed a security guard. And I killed my brother. And they're like, oh, for fucking... Get the car, get the car. That's not so they... good, like, because even if, you know, anyone's watched you do that, at any point, they can be questioned later on by the cops. Did you say anything? Yeah, they were acting really erratically. One of them was shouting, I killed my brother. And like, oh, okay. So he can't be doing anything like that, especially in public. I love it when they pile him outside and Christian Slater just pulls up because he's the boss, really. And he just says, get him in the fucking car. And they just load him in the back of the car. Because he's now like this problem. Get the problem in the car. And then another amazing speech from Christian Slater where he says... Look, we all need to calm down. Do you know what I see in this car? This car is full of love. Yeah? We all love each other because we've done this big thing together. And then he grabs John Favreau. Christian Slater gives John Favreau a massive smooch on the lips, just out of nowhere, and says, come on, we've done all of this for love. And then, yeah, we cut to the funeral. Yeah. The funeral just, is hilarious. <laughs> The one, the dude, he's just um, the one who drove the car into him. He's just crying and crying. I'm so sorry. He sort of climbs on his widow's, the widow's lap. He starts lap. kissing her neck and stuff and just and acting then, really weird. He says, I'll buy you a new minivan. I'll buy you a I'll new minivan. I'll buy you the best minivan there is. <laughs> it's absolute shit show and it's so good. And then he starts hugging the... Um, the Jewish priest as well, the, the rabbi, and yeah. it's just it's terrible, really. Um, John Favreau calls, speaks to Cameron Diaz and says, I'd like to talk to you about potentially modifying the wedding and just making it a bit more of a simple affair. Diaz loses her shit with this. I, I, just, what, what is he doing? What is, is, does he want his life with her? Honestly, like this is not going to be good, is it? So um, there's a meeting between the remaining men, and they're sort of like, the question is, what does his wife know? What did that's the thing? Lois get told? What did Daniel Stern tell her before he died? Then she calls, as they're talk- discussing her, she phones and says, I need to see you guys immediately about, yeah. about, about something I found in a note in his office. It looks like he's confessing to doing something terrible to a woman in Vegas. I need to get you all around here now. That's not good. So they go to visit her. And she asks about Vegas. And they all try their best to sort of, nothing. We just got drunk. Nothing. Uh, but she can see through their bullshit. Now, bear in mind, she's got a broken nose as well. She, she's just lost her husband. She's got a broken nose. And now she's confronting these guys as well about what happened in Vegas. And whilst it looks like they're almost about to find out, Christian Slate is in the background. He just grabs the handle of a kitchen knife. And he's lifting up and down, saying, "You don't want to come on. You don't want to know. I don't know. He's trying to like get her to shut up." And she's like, well, "I know something happened." And eventually, <laughs> I think it's um one from Blurt's Hell. John Favreau that it stands is. up and says, "Okay, well, I'll tell you what happened. He had sex with a a cool girl." And he had to say that. He's he saying that to, to this poor poor woman, saying her now dead husband she thought loved him dearly was having had some problem with sex workers and on the frequent was was dipping his wig. Yeah, they say he had a real thing for prostitutes. He was making really, it even worse. He, I'm re- he felt really guilty about it. He's a real pervert, though. He asked him it to escalates, do some sick though, shit because he just says, "Oh, she." He had it uh, this with this lady, and the only reason he did that because he looked at Boyd, and Boyd's got a knife, and he's like, "Oh my god, Boyd, I don't want her to die. I'm gonna have to tell this." Then one of the others says, "Yeah, I think it's Boyd." Then escalates it by saying, "Yeah, he had a real problem with this." And what? Oh my God! So this web of lies and murder is just getting more and more and it's more. Just, so yeah, it's, it's trying to keep up with it all. Do you know what I mean? It'd be stressful just going. Who knows what about what? Like, you know. Now, Christian Slater, they should know what's going to happen here. He says they to, should. he says to the couple of the lads, right? You guys go and have drinks at the bar. 
just give him some give Jeremy Piven more pills because they're giving him pills to keep him subdued and just go for some drinks I'm going to talk to Lois and calm her down I'll stay at home with her and calm her down <laughs> I, I think John and then he sends just a bit like oh I don't know if I trust this really he sends the kids he says the kids can go and be with Cameron Diaz that's fine she'll look after them the she night before that. a wedding she absolutely loves that doesn't she the night before a wedding and then you're starting to think, is he going to kill Lois? So the other three are getting drunk in the bar. Lois is resting on the bed. And Christian Slater comes in the room. She's got a, I think she's got like a face mask on so she can't see. And he walks and he goes, Lois. And then he just gets a pillow, puts it over her face. But she fights him off. And it turns out she's got a little bit of martial arts training by the looks of it. A little bit. She kicks his fucking ass. <laughs> she says to him, you fucked with the wrong girl this time, Boyd. <sighs> and this re- almost reminded me a bit of that movie Double Date we covered last year with the fight between the guy and the girl, which is... really... When you see a fight between fight. a guy and a girl, you know... When it's evenly matched fighting. Yeah, you're like, Jesus, man. Like, because he's punching her, she's punching him. She's she do, bites she's him doing, in the balls. She's doing those big, big high, high kicks and stuff and side kicks to her and hit him. Yeah, she's, she's pushing, through him, pushing him through the shower. Yeah, pushing through the shower. Cut. She's not giving up at all. Um, eventually, though... Um, Get a phone call, though, don't they? Yeah. Um, guys, I've, cal- I've calmed Lois down. She's resting now, but she really wants to see her brother-in-law... Can you bring him over in the car? Yeah, okay, we'll take him over. So they drive him... The two two innocent ones. So he is smashed as well now, Jeremy Piven. So I'm going to go and see my sister-in-law. And he's like, yep, she wants to give you a big family hug and say she forgives you for everything. I'm just going to walk him in the house, guys. Make sure that he gets in there and sees Lois. They okay? go in there and it leaves them both just sitting in the front there. Now, that, now that's uh, uh, John Favreau and happy old Leyland there. Just sitting in the front of their car. Just sitting there and all of a sudden... Poof, just hear a gunshot sound. Then a little bit after that, Christian Slater gets in the car. Lights a cigarette. Mirror, lights a cigarette. Looks in the, <laughs> comes into the f- uh, light, looks into the reflection of the mirror and goes, Oh my God, she had, you know, she was some bitch or whatever, wiping blood from his face. She like a wild cat. It's like, oh, and they're just like, oh no. So has he just gone and killed, obviously, the other one as well then? So he says, look, what I've done here is, is this, what I've done here is I've made it look like he was, and this is the story, guys, so you're going to stick to this. He's been in love with his sister-in-law all this time. That's why he killed his brother, by driving into him, and eventually he's killed Lois, and then he shot himself, so it was murder-suicide. Okay, what so that's fuck? that's what's happened here. Um, that's the story. So, so they just well, so Christian's in his mind. He's like, "That's it. We're done." The Vegas thing is that's that done. That was another thing. This is now some more deaths, but that's another thing. Past us, we're just gonna carry on. This guy is this guy's bloody Patrick Bateman, isn't he? He is. He is very cold-hearted. Well, we cut to um, a lawyer going through the will of Daniel Stern, and he says, "Well, oh, the good news is, is he had a huge life." Um, uh, policy payout five hundred thousand dollars because you're looking after the kids by the way now because you're the godfather and Cameron Diaz is like we can't look after the fucking kids oh at least we've got five hundred thousand dollars yeah but no after you haven't got that money it... well no first of all you haven't got that money because he missed his last two payments so that's void yeah but we're going to sell the house for you. That's worth four hundred thousand dollars. Oh, okay, okay, that's fine then. No, because after deduction, so they barely get anything. They get fourteen thousand and two kids. Now, I then went and looked up on Google. I looked into wills and use and say, say for example, Dan, in my will, I'm writing you. I'm going to be parents for my three kids as well as your two. Can you don't want that? I, I know you don't want that. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm Elijah's godfather, so yeah, I know. I know. And admittedly, but that's you, you implied. Would probably do it, but... but I'm saying, like, if you say, example, you're like, I don't, no, I don't want to do that. I look, tried looking up. Can you then reject that and say I don't want that? I don't. Or is it in law that you have to take these children? Surely you you'd, can't you'd just have take to be... it. To, 
Because if you don't want them, you're not going to treat them right. You I think you'd so... have to be a bit of a bastard to turn them down, wouldn't you? To your best mate. I guess so, because hopefully they would And your think... three kids were on my doorstep, I'd be like, well, come uh, on in, kids. Well, hopefully you'd think who would take a look after them if that was to happen. Like, you'd think of someone, you'd know someone who's quite good. But I'm just saying, though, so I looked it up and I don't couldn't find anywhere any clause that could get you out of that. <laughs> Well, thanks for looking into it for me. Yeah, I'll be changing my will, so you're going to be having my kids. That's brilliant. What, just tomorrow? Not tomorrow. even if you die? <laughs> Change that now. Dan's got the children. Um, all of this has been in the last sort of three or four days, all of this events, because it's their wedding tomorrow. How heck? Wed, wedding sort of sorting out is quite hectic anyway, let alone throwing in some deaths and some... St- Pretend suicides and love triangle thing going on. Well, some of your best mates are dead now. Just even like, who's going to take that place then? You know, you've got, you've and, got well, to change the tables. Settings. And one of one of your other best mates has killed them. Fucking hell! It's killed one of them anyway. Hmm. Um. So yeah, wedding day, and all that's left is uh, Christian Slater, Charles, and John Favreau. And uh, right, two minutes to show time, boy. So he's still got Christian Slater as his best man at this point. Yeah, and, and John Favreau is freaking out. And he's with her, and he, he can't help it. He blab, blabs, doesn't he? He, he tells says, her. We killed a, a prostitute. Boy, just killing everyone. <laughs> uh, but she says, Right, stand up, man up. I wanted this wedding my whole life. Do you know how hard I've planned? So you are going to come hell or high water. We are getting fucking married today, whether you like it or not. This is not someone you want to marry. So she uh, she takes it very, very well. She, But she does also say, I knew this would happen with those guys. That's why I didn't want you hanging around. She's not in the lightest, slightest bit of surprise that there's a load of people dead. I, I think she's slightly crazy. <laughs> To say the least. Yeah. So, yeah, Christian Slater is still the best man. Two minutes to show time. Um, but then Slater approaches John Favreau and says, I want my money. And he says, what money? He says, the insurance money from Daniel Stern. I know he had a lot of money, and I can t- smell that money. I can taste it, and I want my fucking cut of it. Well, and he's like, what? what? Where is this coming from? And what money is this that he speaks of? He thinks he's got the five hundred thousand dollars. I think. Didn't didn't he, they say to him like, "No, we got fourteen grand and fucking two kids." Well, they end up fighting. <clears throat> this is like two minutes before he's supposed to walk down the aisle, and they have a scrap. Um, but Cameron Diaz comes in the room, and she grabs a coat stand, a metal based coat stand, and smashes Christian Slater's face in. This is the last we. I oh, know we do see him again in a moment, but yeah, she fucks him up. She cr- She does a, um, what's that film? Irreversible with the ex- fire extinguisher. She fucks him up. Yeah. Um, she doesn't care. She <laughs> she wants to get married. She just goes to town on this guy, and it's just like, what the hell? So luckily, he's got four friends because the last one, Leyland Dorser, is now his killed. best man. He's been promoted to best man, Leyland Dorser, because everyone else is not dead. Happy about it, probably. Um. And they're getting married, and the priest says, right, where's the rings then? <gasps> oh, shit, the rings are still with Boyd. Yeah. Uh, and Cameron Diaz didn't even really like Boyd anyway, so I think she wasn't bothered by the fact she, had, she wanted to get rid of all of them anyway, didn't she? Well, quite a comical moment now. Boyd's cr- climbing up the stairs with blood all over him, hmm. uh, laughing like a maniac. And just as he gets to the top of the stairs, Charles Opens smashes the door, the door and falls down. Imagine if he came the out, head. though. That would be the wedding ruined. The cops would be called because everyone would look around and see this character there. Then they would all be busted, I presume. He then has to retrieve the wedding rings from inside his coat pocket. And it's that whole thing going towards it. Oh, oh, they're dead. Are they not going towards them? And the hand grabs them. And they are still, but then he then he doesn't. Yeah, he grabs him a... and then he dies. Yeah. And that's it. And uh, the wedding yeah. all goes ahead. It's all smiles. <laughs> all smiles until Cameron Diaz says, right, I want... Christian Slater buried in the desert with that prostitute and with that security guard. And while you're at it, get rid of that fucking dog too and get rid of Charles. And he says, the dog? Yeah, get rid of the dog as well. Never lie that dog. Whoa, so just take him out and kill him. So because he's a loyal husband, they, him and... Here, I don't care how 
hot. Like, you know, I'm not going to go and kill people. It's just not going to happen. So they drive out to the desert with the dog and Christian Slater's body. And they bury Christian, and then whilst the hole's being dug by Leyland, also. But, but, but just, just quickly, as they go along in the car, we've got some background kind of, kind of uh, Mexican type sort of uh, chilled sort of music, kind of happy. And um, it's quite comical because on the way back, we have that again with the same people in the car, which we didn't think we were going to be returning in the car. But what does happen when they get there? Uh, well, he, he raises the shovel, which. Uh, um, John Favreau to kill Layla and then he and Layla turns around, around and we cut so obviously we're like what happened what happened what happened and we cut to obviously that music playing again and both and of them along. cut to the back seat the dog looks up and just puts his head down so they're all on the way back again he didn't and do he, it and um, Layla also says so I think that'll be the end of that little matter and all the way through it, he's been saying I'm going to go and join Greenpeace. I'm going to go and join the army. I'm going to go live in another country and build a school. So he's probably going to just get far, far away. So Cameron Diaz will probably think he's dead anyway. Um, but they crash a car, the car into another car. <laughs> it's like gets from worse to worse to worse. They, a car crash because he's just in his head. He's figuring out what's going to happen. And okay, da 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 da. Daydream straight into a car crash, straight into the windscreen of another car. Like one of them flies through the windscreen to the windscreen of the other car. They are fucked. And this is very cut to Cameron Diaz looking a little bit tired for wear, cleaning the she, toilet. She's um, cleaning the toilet. She's doing the washing up. She's, she's not got the life she lots. wants. She hasn't. She hasn't got it. Her husband doesn't have legs anymore. John Favreau's in a wheelchair saying... Uh, he, he's trying to coach people. He's trying to coach the kids who are all like uh, embraces, trying to walk along. You can walk, you can do it. You Come on, you come on. Well, the mate's in the background with one of the controlled wheelchairs with his mouth because going back and forth because he hasn't got control of his wheelchair. Yeah, he doesn't know how to control it yet. And then one of the kids, the kids with the crutches Dog's falls got over. three legs. Yeah, even the dog's got three legs. The kid with the crutches, Daniel Stern's kid, falls over and he says, Do you want your new mummy to help? Let's get your new mummy out new here. Mummy She'll out help here. You. Let's get new mummy. And then the backyard, and Cameron Diaz comes out and she just starts screaming. She freaks out and she runs sees, out onto the road. She sees all these amputees, it's even just, the dog, and it's just disabled people. It's not and just, what she wanted. She runs yeah. out into the road screaming with a... Uh, a toilet brush in her hand. <laughs> and that's it. We pan away and that's the end. And um, it's quite funny, really. <laughs> it's such a bleak comment. And Sarah said how much she loved this. And I said to her, I laughed at the end of this. I sent her a message. I know why you like this, because it's a bleak, dark, comical ending. You love that shit. It, it, it really does snowball, doesn't it? It starts off with lots of drugs and drink, well, then it, a death, then a death, then a death, then murder, then suicide death. And... Well, it's funny. Like We start with this woman who's just so crazy about being married that she'd do anything to have this marriage day. But, she, of course, going along with that means you have a stag do. So <clears throat> the husband-to-be goes on a stag do, and all this shit comes from that. But she still goes ahead as marriage because she's so obsessed with being married and ends up with this life of what she wanted, but an extreme version. She wanted to be the housewife cleaning and stuff like that. Not like this, though. So it's um, that's yeah. a, that's a reversal of it. Everybody it's gets funny. what what dark, they deserve. Everybody gets what they deserve in this. You know, Boyd gets killed. Jeremy Piven, who killed someone, gets killed. John Favreau loses his legs and has to look after somebody else's kids. He wasn't as implicit in the murders. He buried them, but he didn't kill people. And the same with Charles. Charles didn't really kill people, but he still helped. So he's in a vegetative state. You know, and but the poor dog didn't deserve to lose a leg. The poor little dog, he's hopping around with three legs. <laughs> and that, that's the gags of this, and that's like why well, I knew Sarah likes it. So there you go, guys. Very bad things. It's um, a real hidden gem, I think I would say. Um, not many people talk about. Um, it's definitely one of my favourite Christian Slater movies. And a real hidden gem from the late 90s. It's not horror, obviously, but it's de definitely dark very dark and brutally bloody comedy and uh, if you you're going to be tense all the way through this i think it's it's a good good laugh mm, it is a, it is a good fun it's in my collection of uh, the dvd as it has been and it's staying in my collection because it's one of those movies you could put on every once in a while i haven't watched it for a while because i was waiting for this review but you can put it on and just sit back and enjoy it because it is quite a fun movie i could probably oh, i don't know i was gonna say i could probably let jay watch it but i don't know if jay would actually like be into it really um <laughs> My, yeah. my 
my final thing I would say about it is the poster is a complete lie, the video cover, the DVD cover, because it's got Christian Slater and Cameron Diaz as the main focus. Like, they're the couple getting married, and he's holding a chainsaw. Oh, yeah, that's And it's right. like, well, none of this takes... Well, he it's does. It's not he what the film is. Chainsaw, he chops up bodies, but... Or whatever they've got. But, yeah, well, they, they it's use, not... like, a it... meat cutter or something. But then again, you know, the, the companies that do the designs of the... Uh, uh... <clears throat> movie covers are generally different companies totally to the who made the films yeah, you know? yeah. well there we go talking of very bad thumbs things up. thumbs up thumbs up thumbs up for me thumbs up for me um, on I, Hill. it's our valentine special and i love this film so mm. Mm. It, is, it is a very fun film and like i said i went to cinema on a date so you know yes now talking of very bad things and also talking of valentine look who's uh stood in the corner Hello, Bill. I didn't see you pop Bill up. Bill Murray. There little, he is. Little Billy popping up. He's dressed as a little bunny rabbit for Valentine's Day. I don't know. I think it's not Easter, Easter Bill. What it's are you Easter. doing? What a love. Oh, he's, you... no, he says he's like a play bunny. I want those play girl bunnies. Oh, my God. You he's know, got his... the mansion. He's got the butt cut out of the back like yeah, the play girls. Yeah, but he's got a fluffy tail over most of his butt cheek. That's OK. Great. Mm. All right, Bill. Well, I think it's time for you to take us into World of the Strange, Ooh. Billy Billy Boy. I do, I do like World of the Strange. Let's see where we are today. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange. World of the Love. Oh, the sexy, strange sexy Strange. Well, thank you, Bill, as always, for doing your intro there. And Bill Murray, really, Sexy Strange. I'm really digging your uh, bunny girl outfit. Um, so, I have one main story. That's it for this. Uh, okay. this, this episode, but okay. Okay. it's very current, it's very exciting, it's very mysterious. Sex robots. I Look, I'll tell you what, <laughs> before we, we get into this, I was watching Westworld the other day. And you want a sex robot? No, but they have a sex, like a sex worker robot comes to his room and he has sex with them. You're talking about the original movie, mm -hmm. not the series that's currently on HBO no, or was on HBO. That. No, it's got a movie. Um, with Yul Brynner. Yeah, that is the future absolutely no well there's already sex whatsoever. robots i mean like proper like look like humans Gav, very much coming along there are you need to do some youtube in i don't want to go down you should hole. see you should see what some of the sex robots look like now it's insane you can program different styles of love making so you... it's presumably silicon because you don't want to stay in the steel down there <laughs> Yeah, it's all silicone. It's basically right. a flashlight on, on a doll. A, on, a, on a Terminator. Oh, Christ. That's, That's so scary, not... doesn't it? I'll be back. <laughs> Hopefully they have a voice changer. And where do you want it, love? Around the back. <laughs> you want it around the back? Give it to me now. I was like, why do you have to be Schwarzenegger's voice? It's not Give sexy. me your clothes, your mother. You... And then after you've used it for six months, he's telling your friend, he's like, you know you can program different voices into it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I quite, I quite like the Arnie voice, though. Imagine, imagine this. Oh, listeners, this, imagine this. If if Sex Robot and the voice changer is like back in the day when the sat-navs came out and you could have a Mr. T and you could have someone from the Monty Python or, 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 or whoever you want doing the voices, telling you your direction, Samuel Jackson, to the left motherfucker or whatever. What if you could do that for sex dolls? Nicolas Cage. <laughs> oh yeah give it to me big boy all oh, right okay right right now james brown oh, i feel good i feel good one two three four stick it in my ass oh my god well you'd have to be careful though because there's some celebs that have been ter terrible people now so like That'd be yeah. bad. You want to go back and say, well, we've got to get rid of those 80s ones we've programmed in. They're no good anymore. They're wrong. Yeah. Get, get rid of the Michael Jimmy Jackson get, voice. Get rid of Jimmy Savile. That is just not good. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it'd be a sick fucker. I'd want that. Anyway, that, Dan. That, but that is not the strange. story. What is the story? The story is something Morning that is glory. in the news for the last two weeks. 
And I've just watched President Biden give a speech about it before we recorded. And that is the fact that suddenly there are unidentified aerial or flying objects being shot down around the world. Now, I'm going to lead you through the news, the the stories as I've got them up until I've recorded this episode. And we might come back to this because the story is unfolding on a daily basis. But what we know is, is that a Chinese spy balloon which is a weird thing to say, was shot down over the US a few weeks back. Um, They're still recovering the debris from the sea. Um, But Biden said on his speech today, only a few hours ago, that the reason he shot it down over the sea was because it was safe. It it was about the size of a school bus, he said. So obviously weighed quite a lot. It was quite big. If they'd have shot it down over a city, it could have injured people. So he the army to shoot it down over the sea firstly so that it didn't hurt anybody and secondly so that they could recover what it was and study it so they they haven't collected all the evidence yet and obviously they're not going to reveal anything until they know 100% what it is but they think it, they know it's a Chinese spy balloon and it was obviously potentially being used to spy on the US um, but however about a few days after that happened three more unidentified aerial objects or flying objects were shot down one over canada and two more over america and the he declined to say what they were yet he said he alluded to aliens or ufos he said i know there's a lot of theories out there about unidentified flying objects and i'm not here to talk about that i'm here to tell you the facts which is these other three objects are being studied we're finding the debris from them but they were huge they were non-manned so they weren't being piloted but they were very big and we don't know what they were he spoke to canada's president a prime minister and made sure that they were happy about them shooting this down so they've shot down four one of which was a balloon but four unidentified aerial objects now that was exciting enough wasn't it you heard this? No, of course. It's all over the news. There's loads of alien theories, you know. This links in with what I talked about in the last episode, where I said there's a shift in, not just because the Earth's core has slowed down, but there's a shift in things feel different lately. People aren't treating each other in the same way. It feels like there's a lot of stuff that's about to come out from under the surface. And so this blew my mind all of this stuff so let's talk about this first of all and then i've got two things which is going to blow your mind clean off in a minute but what do you think about these things first of all what what do you think's going on here with these americans uh sightings these things being shot down um there's a couple of different trains of thought for it some people are saying because i know sorry i know that you love ufos yes i know that I absolutely <clears throat> um, do love that idea and um, feel like it is a reality in some sense. You know, um, it's a whole massive debate, the whole UFO. I all agree with UAP you. thing. Um, but yes, yes, of course. UAP you want stands that. for Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, is that right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you've got these different objects, and one over Alaska it was. I don't know where the other one was in America. Um, yeah. The, it's interesting because some people want to train thought of it. Some people are saying it is a distraction from um, there was like a massive train. Do you see the train derailment in Ohio? But, um, not in America. And um, uh, fuck, I should know. Did you not? Do you know? Do you see about that? No, I, I don't. I heard about it, but I don't. I don't quite. It's essentially what. like a, there's a, a, a state, and it could be like another snowball type instant because you got the um, the train leakage and the chemical has gone into the river flow, and it's flowed very far down. And of course, we've got the anything, tragedy. All the animal livestock, everything starting to die. People, livestock starting to die. You know, and it's not been reported, and the reporters were being arrested. <clears throat> and, and there's also the tragedy that's just struck Turkey and Syria, where around fifty thousand people so far confirmed dead from a terrible earthquake. Mm. Um, and they think that that number will double by the time the dust, if you pardon what I'm about to say, by the time the dust settles, they think there's going to be around 100,000 deaths which is just tragic um, um, but I think the other thing the, the derailment the people saying that at the same time but that could just be a coincidence of these two incidents happening at the same time um, but it had been a, a 
you know distraction from that and putting these up there because it is it is a distraction it is a very easy thing to do it is, it's a very simple thing to do to, to, it's uh, magicians do it directors film directors do it look over here but really what's going on is over here I don't know uh, the first one being a spy object obviously they got to get rid of that that's not good you shouldn't be doing that why are you doing that that's not you know that's not right you know that we, we've got a game we're trying to play here which is ridiculous we should all be uniform, unified which is another thing if there was aliens most of us should really probably at the same time we actually all come together Biden said um, he doesn't apologise for shooting shooting that one down or shooting any of them down no but he says I am going to be in talks with China's president over the next few weeks um, we're not well, going to war with them we're just going to talk about this well um, not like <clears> the <throat> sea but the sea's a bit more where you have pirates and pirate radio and all that sort of stuff I think the air is you've got uh, certain areas which are say like this is our air um, so like everyone like I said it's like a game you don't come into ours we don't go into yours that's the end of it if you come into ours we could get shot like if you go into yours you could probably shoot us it's it's that so the first one that the next one's coming up then being shot and not know what they are I don't know um, there's not been anything else more of it I'd love it to be aliens but I don't think it is if it is aliens we've shot them down and they're going to be really pissed off and it's going to be an independence day scenario I, I don't think I don't think we'd be able to shoot them that easily so I'll talk you through the, the four incidents very pre briefly and then I'll tell you the other two things that are going to blow your mind okay so the, the first one was 60,000 feet high the balloon um, it had um, oh sorry it was the size of three buses it weighed over a tonne uh, it was equipped with multiple antennas and huge solar panels large enough to power several intelligence gathering sensors. So that was the one that we know what that was, but they're gonna, they want more backstory on it before they reveal more. The second incident occurred when US fighter jets scrambled and shot down an object over the sea ice in North Alaska, northern Alaska. It was different to a balloon. It was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. It was flying at 40,000 feet seem to be made of metal but there's no obvious use of propulsion or control mm. which that is sounds obviously... like a ufo yeah and who, who's that coming from uh this is just in this is just what's been told to the press at the moment that's all we know jibber jabber yeah jibber jabber fool that's the third time mr t's come up in this podcast um the third object was shot down uh, over Canada in the Yukon Territory, 100 miles from the U.S. border. Mm. Smaller than the first balloon, but this one was cylindrical, almost cigar-shaped. Now, we know cigar-shaped uh, is a UFO type. Uh, this one was flying about 40,000 feet. We don't know anything more about that one. Mm. And then another one happened um, over Lake Huron in Michigan. Uh, it was shot down over the lake, uh, and it was flying at 20,000 feet. Um all of these have been shot down because they they, they pose a threat to normal aeroplanes flying long you know it could cause terrible things well it is interesting it, uh, it, you know there's no way it could have got as far as it could these objects presumably in the airspace without being scanned and seen so like how have they popped up there unless you know it is um it is U uaps or ufos and they're coming out oh, my theory is like they come from the water you know like is this formula there or they have like the dimensional port thing pew you know S biden we can, we can said all sorts of this well biden said uh, um in answer to the question i've heard which is why are there suddenly lots of ufo or unidentified aerial objects being seen is because we're looking for them um now that since that first one we've been on a high alert we've we've amped up our radar and we've been s scouring the sky and anything that's strange we're shooting down so he said don't worry there's not an influx of this however it's interesting they're telling us all this as well quite openly but i know we have sort of in the past couple of years been a bit more open the government has so the, the blaming the china government this is as well they're blaming china however mm. in romania Mm. Romanian army Some scrambled Dracula. fighter jets after detecting a suspicious aircraft in space, an unidentified aircraft in Romania. Oh, I didn't know this. And that was shot down. Was it? So Romania has had a similar thing happen, which hasn't been widely reported the in the news. Though, I don't think you and uh, these alien spacecrafts are so complex. You don't understand like what they ha what the materials that they use are not from this planet. And how do you know? 
it's got to be because of the way that the the compulsion a uh, compulsion the uh, uh, the oomph. What's the word? The propulsion. Propulsion. Um, is and the fact that everything about them, no heat signature, there's like they just appear. They can go to where it's somewhere else needs to go really but, quickly. It's like it's it's. But not, you don't know that. You how don't can know they that. just let uh, uh, something sh- shoot them and hit them? I think they would be able to just detect that and get away from there quicker. But what if we are better than aliens? <laughs> no, we don't. What with Will Smith? No, we don't. <laughs> Just then, Will Smith, we're a bunch Kurt of Russell. fucking monkey idiots. We are. Um, but yeah, so this happened. Nothing more has been released other than they're um, they're collecting the debris in Romania and they're trying to figure out what that was. Now everybody's blaming the Chinese, but the final part to this and the the, the whopping mind blowing part is that Chinese authorities have prepared to and shot down an unidentified flying object flying over the Shandong province in the last couple of days. So China... Now, my wife said, yeah, of course they'll say that. They'll make up a story so they look like they're the good guys. Now, I'm not blaming China. I don't want to start a a cold war here. Um, But the Chinese are now saying that they've shot down an unidentified object in the sky over Shandong. Yeah. Um, They shot it down. They they scrambled some... um, jets and they shot down this thing again they're collecting the debris what if they all of a sudden everyone all the, all the governments all of a sudden went and they, they're domino effect they're just literally going like all right fuck it let's start shooting them we've seen them for years let's start shooting them now because we Ooh. never have tried shooting them before so i might be completely wrong about that if they are aliens they could be shot i guess because but then it's like the, the animal that's never seen the human being. You go over to touch them, they're like, oh, touch me. And they get kicked in the head. And they run off and they go, oh, I'm never going to go past that too big person thing. They think like nice things again. So th- then they, you know, they tell the others that, tell the other so, animals. So back on planet, wherever, yeah, they're yeah, saying, yeah. look, don't go on holiday to Earth. They're just don't, shooting us down. They are fucking not very nice. Don't go there. Um... They're, they're just destroy us. Then we'll all wake up and we'll be like a massive simulation somewhere else. So this is very exciting. Um, no one's hurt, been hurt or killed. Um, so I can talk about that. You know, I can say it's exciting. It is very exciting. I, I will want to know more. Are we on the verge of finding out that there is life on other planets or at least intelligent life Zipping around in the skies by shooting them. What so? What you mean is they're going to study the uh, what the debris? Yeah. Or the ships if they're not too damaged. Because um, let's be honest, that you know, you and no, I are no, on the same page well, here. No, apparently, they've still been doing this for years. If if that is not true, and this is the first time they're ever studying them, then yeah, of course we're going to find out. But it's still going to be material which is not made from this earth, guaranteed the consequences of on mankind if this is real if this is you know and, and the, aliens let's, let's for example say this is they're publicly saying everything truthfully which they never believe the government's to do exactly yeah or if they are and they're going ahead saying this is what we're doing we could take you along as we would do it we could live stream it on youtube we could do the do you know what i mean imagine if they really did that and really open it wasn't a thing like that because all these that files would, that, would, that would that would fuck the whole world up because of religion as well with a major well, reason They've been drip feeding all these files and video footage from the the army over the last few years, and they keep every now and again, like, oh, twenty years has passed, we're allowed to release these files now. Another twenty years, so maybe the time has come for us just to be told that not necessarily what they are, who they are, that we've spoken to them, just that there are things flying around that we don't know what they are. It's, if if they if you people who the people who look at. Uh, the people who say stuff and go, or media people, whoever the head people are of these different departments, they're telling the press people this, and the audience are listening to that. And those people are then being told this other thing, but they're trusting these people. They always have done before. They're telling that, and they the very b- believe in, in their religion is very strong. It's just going to fuck the world up totally. There's going to be so much shit going on. It would just start making a massive war of religion almost. I would, I would say. Oh, great. That's what we just need, another war. That's what I would go with, and I'd think it would just be like a massive 
fucking clusterfuck. <laughs> I think it would... Um, Waiting to explode. I think you're right, I think, but I think it would split the world down the middle, and I think yeah, half yeah, the world yeah. would unite and become more hippy-dippy, and in a good way, you know, we'd all be sort of like, oh, man, let's embrace these people, and let's be together as a, as mankind, as one race, you know, regardless of colour, creed, yeah, sex, yeah, you, or whatever. You're always going to have, like, a massive population which is going to be like, we just need to unite, and that's going to be, it'd be like... Um, yeah, people who are for war and people who are not for war, you know, peace lovers and stuff like that. There's but then you're going to get fanatics. Oh, of course. But you would on both sides. And then you're going to get the people that are like, I fucked an alien! But I mean, you would have that massive consortium of people from around the world, hopefully global, to come to imagine they could go to one country and that'd be the one country which is the, the good country. Well, here's my ultimate, before we, we wrap up, here's my ultimate. Um, what I'd love it to be for you anyway Gav I'd love it to be that these are all just drones mm. but they're coming from a, a spaceship and the spaceship pulls up lands Bigfoot and his family get out see I'm happy with that and they go look guys we speak English we've been living in the forest but we have got this amazing technology um, you know we live deep underground in the forest and I'm here to tell you all that the Earth is flat. That'd be cool. Be happy with that? Yeah, I, I, I to be honest though, if it was actually a thing and uh, aliens and this actually happened, I don't think I want that. <laughs> I want it just to be some spy drone. For, I, even myself, much as I want it and I kind of believe in that stuff, it's not going to go well with my mind. We just need to make sure that we're shooting down things that aren't going to affect. Yeah, I, I like just talking about UAPs and doing a podcast, uh, like the High Strangers podcast, plug. Um, and when we did that episode on it, I really enjoyed doing that and the research, but I don't know. I'd be, I'm kind of scared for it to actually be <laughs> legit. Well, we we might well come back to this one, guys, um, yeah. if, if we get more invaded, news. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> or if we just get more updates. Um, I might not do it in World of the Strange, probably just chat about it in the intros to our upcoming episodes. But Biden has said he will be open with, when he says the, the US, he means everybody, us, the world, because I watched it here in, in the UK. So, you know... We're going to find out more as this as come, more facts come out, I suppose. So stay tuned for more. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Bill is doing a Vulcan sign over there. Live long and prosper. Yeah, okay. It could be Spock, I suppose, Bill. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Oh, that's not a Vulcan sign. He's doing the shocker. Oh, that yeah, is He's sticking rude. your fingers up like Sid James. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get well, out of here. Bill, take us out. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. From the director of Top Gun and Beverly Hills Cop 2. Hello, baby! Clarence? I'm a married man, buddy. <laughs> a con man. Ask him if he got the letter. Did you get the letter? What letter? They want to talk to you. No, Tom, tell him we gotta go. A call girl. You call for a day? Huh? Ah! I'm Alabama. She a four alarm fire or what? She seems very nice. What are you doing in LA anyway, huh? And a suitcase full of trouble. My name is Vincent Cocotti. I work as consul for Mr. Blue Lou Boyle, the man your son stole from. Now, all that stands between them and their wildest dreams. Find out who this wing and a prayer artist is and take them off at the neck. Are 60 cops, 40 agents. He's a wild man, this kid Clarence. I like him. 30 mobsters. I haven't killed anybody since 1984. And a few thousand bullets. We're all gonna die here. These are cops. Put it down. Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, Dennis Hopper, Val Kilmer, Gary Oldman, Brad Pitt, Christopher Walken. Slow it down, man. In a Tony Scott film. I think what you did, I think what you did was so 
Not since Bonnie and Clyde have two people been so good at being bad. True Romance. True Romance from 1993. In Detroit, a lonely pop culture geek marries a cool girl, steals cocaine from a pimp, and tries to sell it in Hollywood. Meanwhile, the owners of the cocaine, the mob, track them down in an attempt to reclaim it. Quite, quite a thing going on there, really, isn't there? Yes, there is. 1993, 40 years old now, Tarantino's first script um, started life as a bigger script, which he split off into Natural Born Killers and this. He wanted to make uh, this himself be his first film, I think. And then couldn't get the funding or something, rather, I don't know. I think that's right. He let Tony Scott direct it. Um, well, Tony sold, sold the script, yeah. He, did, he, did, he did, famously didn't like the Natural Born Killers movie. Yeah, he said that Tony Scott did a really good job um, with this script. He really liked it. The only thing that Tony Scott changed heavily was the ending, where the ending, the two main characters are... Uh, well, Christian Slater dies at the end in the in the original script, but he said I actually applaud Tony Scott for changing that. Um, and he is most proud in his entire career of the Sicilian scene, which we'll get to um, with Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper. Although he said I don't like the um, there's a little bit of ad libbing at the end where. One of them calls one of them an eggplant, and the other one calls the other one a cantaloupe. And they, Chris Walken smirks a little bit because he breaks character a little bit. He didn't like that, but he said he's very, most proud in his whole career of that scene so mm. far. And he's got a big career, Tarantino. Uh, but it's not a Tarantino movie. It's, well, it is, but it's Tony Scott directed. But it definitely has Tarantino it, all over it. Straight away from when the film starts, it, it's, it's taken. It's, it's like... Obviously, it wasn't because... You're not taking, I don't know, you know, is Oliver Stone is quite a very opinionated person. Maybe he took that script as, I don't give a fuck, I'm doing it as I want to. Um, Same with, like, Stanley Kubrick with Shining, possibly. But, like, at first I was watching this, because then I thought, oh, Natural Born Killers, that, that changes my opinion of this. But at first watching this, I was thinking, is that a case of his script is so... Tarantino, it flies off the page so much that when you go to direct a film or make the film, it kind of works with that. But I feel like Tony Scott was more of that sort of director, because rest in peace. Um, I feel like he was that sort of director who was a bit more pop, a bit more uh, uh, more in Tarantino sort of world ish. Where Oliver Stone, he certainly, isn't, yeah, Oliver like, Stone a, is a, his a own person, does his own thing, isn't he? But you're right. I think Tony Scott gets Tarantino because this feels like a Tarantino film but it isn't Tarantino like even the people in it even their performance uh, maybe not the performances so much actually um, and but similar the, but can, the, the, the cast you know sim- similar can be said of Rodriguez who directed Dust Till Dawn which was a Tarantino script you know he gets yeah. Tarantino um, and I think Tarantino mm. directing his own script is usually the best, but there's two occasions where, and this being one of them, and Dust Will Dawn being and the other. Both are having a big cast, a ensemble cast. Yeah, wow. And let's talk about the, the cast Natural here. Natural Born Killers does have quite a few big people there too. It does, it does. But this cast is not a list at the time, especially, but um, now and most of these people have gone on to huge things. But we've got. Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette. The chemistry between them is sublime. They are incredible in this. And let's let's not beat around the bush. This is a fairy tale. There's a fairy tale ending. It's slightly above normal reality, you know. It, but it's just. Go on. But it's just that the, they are brilliant. They make this film. Those two, Alabama and Clarence. <laughs> What were you going to say? Do you think it's holding sticks and actually running around it is beating the bush? Or, or you're not like beating off or anything, beating off around the bush. 
beating the bush. Where, I've never on? understood the phrase beating around the bush, to be honest with it's you. The kettle, the, kettle, the kettle of fish the other day. I said, I like, what's kettle of fish? It can't be like a kettle you make tea in. Is it just like some sort of other thing called it, which is a kettle, which you have for the fish? Yeah. There's a lot of sayings that we use that I've no idea why we use them. I've never, no, I don't, I'm looking at it as like, what is that? What is a kettle of fish? Other people in this, Dennis Hopper, it's fantastic in this. Uh, Val Kilmer, you wouldn't even know it was Val Kilmer in this, but he plays... Elvis Presley. They, well, they weren't allowed to call him Elvis Presley because they weren't allowed the to use his... They call him the mentor. The mentor. They, they weren't allowed to use his likeness or name him Elvis, but apparently Lisa Marie, that, Presley, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisa Marie Presley said that she really liked his portrayal. Uh, Gary Oldman is... Well, this is this is like in this film you have two major scenes in this film which are very 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 gold films, and these characters are quite big film actors, film actors, film people, personalities in the in the world, and they're only in the movie for so such a small bit. But you remember these movies so well. I remember Gary Oldman in this movie so much, but he's only in it for such a small amount, and it's the scene when obviously. Uh, Slater goes to see him, Christian Slater, and then the Dennis Hopper and the Christopher Walken scene though, in the in the caravan. Those two scenes are so impacting scenes culturally. You know, they go down in, in the history of like scenes of movies like really impacting scenes. Not 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 the Drexel one so much, but that was quite an impacting scene when he when the kid goes there and the balls to go there and go. Here you go. Yeah. I don't, what was his plan? But we we'll get to that. We we'll get to. That. Um, yeah, so you've mentioned Christopher Walken is incredible in this. Um, Samuel L. Jackson, Blink and You'll Miss, he's in this as well. Yeah, Brad, Brad Pitt is a Brad Pitt, Blink and You'll Miss. A lot of people don't realise he's in it. Michael Rappaport as Dick is wonderful in this. I do like him. Yeah, James exactly. James Gandolfini, Chris Penn, and following on from last episode, Tom Sizemore is, is back for yeah, a second episode yeah, in a row. It's, yeah, there's loads small, of people. Small scenes. Um, I also really like um, Elliot Blitzer, played by Bronson Pinchot, um, the, the coke guy who is trying to buy the coke for his boss, but we'll get to his character. I think he is so funny. That scene with him in the car getting the blowjob and then the coke goes all over him and the cop pulls him over. It's so, so, so funny. But we'll, we will get to all of that. Um, it's also got a Tarantino soundtrack, hasn't it, Gav? It's, you know, pop music, pop culture music all the way through it. And uh, we've also got to say, uh, uncredited uh, um, uh, writer of Roger Avery. Who, yeah, who of course. Tarantino yeah, of course. wrote of other people. But yeah, it's one of those things you always forget about Roger Avery. Do you know what I mean? He did help help Tarantino in ways. I, I tell you who we should forget about is um, Harvey Weinstein producing yeah, it, yeah. Him yeah, and his brother. You can't get away without talking films about Weinstein being the producer in probably quite a lot of the films that we will talk about in the future to come because he was producing lots of films. Probably worth talking about, Gav. Um, I know you said it was one of the first DVDs you ever bought, so let's quickly get into how we were introduced to this film. It's 40 years old now, like I keep saying, uh, but it is one that people talk about still to this day. I just realised you said that, 40 years old. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? <laughs> That's 1993. Insane. That's insane. Or is it 30 years old? No, it's 40 years old, isn't it? Yeah. 93, 2003, 2003. No, it's, not, no, it's 30. It's 40. No. 93, 2003. Yeah, it's, 90, it's 40 years old. 93 was 40 years ago, mate. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the maths on his fingers. It's 30 years old. 93, it's 2003, years old. 2013, 2023. 2003, 2013, 2023. Oh. No, 23. 30 years old. Oh, my God. Oh, is it 30, 30 years old? Yes. Okay. Stop spinning me out, man. It's 50 years old, this film. I can't believe it. <laughs> Okay, so it's 30s old, even so. It was like 40 years of, what the fuck? Yeah. Um, it's a really good film, like, it, you know, um, it's quite funny, Sarah, coming out of this and saying, I quite liked the other one better. And she says this one's like more star, um, style over substance, but I don't know, I feel like this. there's a lot of substance here. I love this, the whole 
lead up to the sort of Reservoir Dogs bit where it's obviously the big gunfight at the end. I love the whole build up of this. There's cocaine being accidentally stolen with a the sex work involved and these two people in love on the, on the road and then think great we can sell this then a, a, like a gangsters after them as well so, but they don't know about and then the cops are there all of a sudden involved as well it's very it, it, you can tell where Tarantino got obviously all his influences from like uh, eastern films and stuff you know he um, said movies. this is this is the most autobiographical script he ever wrote because Christian Slater works in a comic book store and Tarantino famously worked in a video store and he said he based him a, a lot on him. He also based Floyd, Brad Pitt's character, on most of his roommates that he knew at the time. And <laughs> we all know them. And he said that um Lee, who is the producer who's buying all the Coke, it was a, an amalgamation of um Tony Scott and Joel Silver. Uh not Tony Scott, Ridley Scott and Joel Silver, or somebody it's a very high up um That's producers. Um so he based it on people that he knew and himself and lots of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, and it, it, you know, he's very proud of it. It's the first proper script he wrote, although it ended up being split into a couple of movies. It's, it's just great. What, what I love about it, and I can't remember the first time I saw it, it's probably when I was at college, but what I love about it is all the way through all this ridiculous, this suspension, disbelief nonsense that's going on, gangsters and violence, you've got such a sweet, genuine feeling love story between these two who I, she, she is just adorable in I this totally, totally felt the love of them when they are at the the uh along the road there the uh phone box and they start oh, having yeah, sex totally. just like the, the love that they have for each other so excited for each other and just being with each other and i got a bit teary on the end scene as well on the beach which we'll get to um mm. just because it felt so romantic and nice and it is the, the movie's called true romance you know it's yeah, um, but it is is a cool film. It's it's you know it's a crime drama romance thriller. Um, it's good. Uh, okay, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So we start off in a bar where we're introduced to Clarence, Christian played Slater. by Christian Slater. He's talking about Elvis. This guy is obsessed with Elvis Presley. Kind of chatting up someone. Yeah, talking to a girl, and he says to her, "Look, I'm not saying I'm gay, but." Well, he uses a slur, but he says, but if I had to fuck a guy, I'd fuck Elvis. It's, it's straight away you're into, like, Quentin Tarantino dialogue. This is that dialogue so many people tried to replicate in the 90s as well. And she's like, well, I'd fuck Elvis too. And he's like, well, hey, great. Do you want to come watch a, a movie with me? She's like, you what? He says, oh, I, I want to go and watch a Street Fighter with um, Sonny, what's his name? Sonny uh, Chiba. Sonny Chiba. Um, it's a, the greatest martial artist on working bill. in film. It's a triple bill. Oh, okay. And, and she's just like, no. And he's just she's so like, disappointed. She says, you want to take me to go see a Kung Fu movie? He's like, no, I want to take you to go and see three Kung Fu movies. And she's like, see ya. She just walks out the bar. I saw a Tarantino movie on my birthday once, and I wondered if I was going to meet a sex worker in the cinema. I didn't. <laughs> I met somebody in the cinema once and ended up dating her. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I went to watch Lake Placid. <laughs> Believe it or not, and it wasn't. And um, I was sat there on my own watching this, and the traders were playing. And I turned around and I saw my sister and her friend walk in. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that because now my sister and other people will know who this is. And um, about ten minutes into the film, I said to my sister, "Why don't you come and sit over with me, you two? So her mate came over. She sat between me and... And I'd never really met her friend before. And she was throwing popcorn at me and flirting with me. I ended up going for beers with them after. Then I ended up getting her number and then we ended up dating. Uh, we didn't steal loads of cocaine or anything like that. No. But, um, you know, I dated her for a while. Anyway, there we go. Um, so, yeah, so this girl doesn't work. So he, he thinks, fuck it, I'll go to the cinema. That's what I'm planning to do. We find out later on, a bit later on, it's his birthday. And that's what he plans to do. He goes to his the cinema on his own for his birthday every year so he goes and he watches street fighter return of street fighter and sister of street fighter the three street fighter movies in a row and we're not talking jean-claude van damme by the way this isn't the, the movie that he's watching it's the <laughs> the original uh, street fighter movie not to do with the video games um so he's uh we're in detroit and we get a bit of a voiceover from alabama talking about i never thought that 
Detroit would be the place that I found well, my true love. So you kind of get this romantic sort of fairy tale narration going on. Um, she yeah, goes into the cinema. It's a, it's a right story. It's almost like a book you're reading or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They do that. It's, it's making it so you're watching a film. It's a story. Do you know what I mean? We can, when you watch a movie sometimes, you can really get into that movie and be like, oh my God, that's just disturbing or whatever. This is saying to you, yeah, no, sit back and relax. This is a movie. This is a story. Yeah, this is, this is a story. story. And Tarantino does that with a lot of his films. And again, I know you that know, Tony he sucks, directed this, but... He you knows he sucks you in a dialogue. That's straight away. So starting over that odd fuck Elvis, blah, blah, blah. That, that straight away makes you sit up, your ears sit up, and your brain go, oh, what's this? And you start listening to it. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. Um... Alabama walks into the, the cinema and she starts talk she, she starts talking to Christian Slater and says, What did I miss? So he kind of Well, well oh. they kind of, she walks in and he spots her and he's like, Oh, oh shit. Because like, obviously he's like, you know, she's like, She's hot. He's like, Oh my God, I'm desperate for a lady. Like, oh my God, she's by herself. And then she comes over and he's like, Oh my God. So it looks, looks down, he gets his popcorn, just looks up and she sits down next to him. Can I, can I sit here? And he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool. She spills popcorn all over him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm and she brushes it off of his thigh in his lap. And yeah, then she's, yeah, yeah. she says, um, what am I missing? So this is the equivalent to my wife saying to me, oh, can you explain to me one of the Marvel movies plots? Because then he goes, well, what's happened is this guy here is doing this, this, and this, and this. So he's really excited to like tell her all about this. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like that. That's cool. Um, so she ends up watching all three movies with him. Um, well, we don't know at what point she might be walking into the end of the last movie. Uh, no, I think it was the first Street Fighter movie he's watching. Oh, well, well I don't know. So she's watched all three. So because he walks out and he says, "I can't believe you sat through a triple bill of Street Fighter movies with me." She's like, "Well, you know, I like you like kung fu movies," and she starts doing kung fu moves on him, and there's flirting and the chatting, and there's a chemistry already between them. Um, and she says, "Do you want to go and get some pie? A piece of pie?" And he's like, what? She's like, well, after a movie, I like to go and get a piece of pie and just discuss all the aspects of the film. The, immediately, his nerd boner is going, rah, 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 rah. It, okay. It, it's like us guys, man, back in the day, before you have the internet and forums when you can meet people, etc. And then, like, to, to, like someone, someone even likes horror. Oh, my God. But, like, imagine that, like, a hot girl likes horror. Oh, my God. What's happened? I'm definitely going to, the next thing comes out of my mouth is going to fuck this up. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Well, they go and get a piece of pie, and the chemistry between them is adorable. She asks him for a taste of his pie, and he does feed it to her. Oh, they yeah. talk about um, the film. They talk about Elvis. Feeding the pie to each other. <laughs> he eats her hairy pie. They get to know each other. <laughs> well, they start doing turn-ons and turn-offs and stuff, and they really get to know well, each other, and it's quite sweet. He does the Playboy. So in Playboy, apparently they do a favourite uh, colour, turn-ons, turn-offs, favourite movie. And so he does all those. Where are you from? She doesn't answer a lot of those questions, but she does answer some of them. And he says to her, like, why did you talk to me? Why are you, are you doing this? She's like, you, you look like a nice guy. You just mm. look like a nice guy. He can't believe his luck. Um, he says, look, can I show you something cool? So they go to his place of work, which is a comic book store that he's worked at for four years. At this point, he must be like going to the bathroom and he's having a wee look in the mirror and be like, I'm going to get laid. I think I'm, I think I'm going to get laid. You know, He's doing the John Travolta thing and Pulp Fiction. He's like, you're going to go back in that room. Yeah. You're going to be really cool. Gonna be cool. Yeah, but yeah, there, but then that, that situation. Do you remember? He's, he's, he's like, you're not gonna do a goddamn thing. You're gonna go home. Yeah. You're gonna beat off, and that's all you're gonna do. I love that when Travolta just does that little. You're gonna jerk off. He does that little hand movement when he says that's it. What are you gonna do? Did my son as well as? Um, he says to her, "Do you want to see what Spider-Man number one looks like?" And she's like, "Sure." So he's he goes for it. He's like, Look at the artwork, the story. She's you know. while well, he's passionately saying this, she looks at him and realizes like this is a really sweet, cute guy who's like just innocently, passionately into these innocent like comic books or whatever. So like you know, she's like, "I, I like this dude. He's nice." You know what? I've never really given Patricia Arquette much as an actor, but she does incredible. This and she, you see her falling in love with him 
at this point. They've only known each other for a few hours. You got, you got, see it. It's one of those movies, like, when you get a film with the performances from all this, obviously you've got some good players in it anyway, but <clears throat> it comes down to director. And not, <clears throat> excuse me, the performances of them both, like working out and just getting in there. And But yeah, the director's obviously got a sort of thing going on, but it works. She's very good. And they go back to his place and they make some sweet, sweet love. Sometimes are high. Um, but they look like they're actually making love as opposed to just having a sex scene, you know? I didn't really pay that much attention. It's a bit like a yeah, sex scene. Okay. He wakes up and she's not in the bed. She's smoking a cigarette on the balcony, crying. She finds herself on the roof looking out on this crazy balcony. What's wrong, Alabama? She comes clean. Ah, <sighs> okay. I'm a cool girl. You're a whore? <laughs> yeah, but but you're my first customer. I've only been doing it for four days. She says, I'm not a whore. I'm a cool girl. There's a difference. Mm. I'm not damaged goods. He's fine. Ba- basically, his boss paid for her for his birthday treat. Which is um, kind of sweet of him. And <laughs> he just to pretend to go in there, fall for him, have sex, and then just go. And she wrote a note on the side for him, but she didn't have the heart to give it to him. Because he just she just said, dear Clarence. Because you know what I'm saying, she realised that she's, you know, really into him, and he's not that bothered by it, and she's pissed by that. She says, aren't you mad? And he's like, no, I had the best night of my life. And she's like, what, the sex? He's like, well, the sex, yeah, but the conversation, the company, and like, I you're incredible. Was really good of him, because if that had been me, I'd have broken down in tears. <laughs> 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 um, she mentions... Uh, what about Drexel? And he's like, what's a Drexel? She's like, don't worry about that for now. We'll come back to that. And he's, she says, but I, I think I love you. And he's like, hang on, let me, let me try to quantify the situation here. Because if you're telling me you love you, and if I tell you I love you, then we're really doing this. And uh, is it, can this be happening? Is this legit? Let's, uh, I love you. And they get married in the morning. This is crazy, isn't it? Hello, Mr. Worley. Hello, Mrs. Worley. And there, then they get matching tattoos. It's, it's so nice that they do. They, they are cast really well, those two, for being in love with each other. It, fit, it works really well. It does. Mm. There must have been some real chemistry going on there. Yeah. Um, she, she, re- she tells about Drexel. Oh, she says, Drexel was my pimp. Um, he beat up my friend. He's not not a nice guy, and he's like, oh, okay, is he ever beating you up? No, no, no. I just, you know, I just wanted you to know that. It's only he's been like, well, look, a few days. He can't touch you now. Don't worry about that. We're married. Forget about all that life. You're with me now. Then we cut to a scene where we meet Drexel, don't we, Gav? Yeah, this is as hip hop as Gary Oldman will ever be. He's got dreadlocks. He's dreadlocks, got one got eye. Big scar. No, he's got he's one. What? Yeah, he's got big contact lens in there. It's a fake eye. A massive scar down his face. He's got um one of the the eye he contact lens he wears is the eye from Dracula. The same eye that he wore when he was a monster in Dracula. And in fact, the same makeup artist. He said that he insisted on the Dracula makeup artist coming to work on him in this. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because he uh he really liked it. His mum was on set for a lot of this Gary Oldman's mum and she was 80 years old <laughs> and she said mum come to work it's come to work with your Sunday <laughs> this is the scene where I'm going to try and kill Christian Slater I, I'm, I'm going to use lots of slurs uh, yeah, I'm going to loads of slurs I'm going to talk about titties and all sorts and I'm going to be I'm basically I'm going to be like I'm I'm, I'm an African American mum really yes my favourite line. And this says, is going to be a British mum, isn't it? Obviously, because he's British. So you imagine like a British eighty-year-old mum sitting there over the scene, watching this scene happen. It's not really Coronation Street, is it? My favourite thing he says in a different scene is when he asks him to sit down and have some Chinese food, and he says, uh, "Grab yourself an egg roll." And then he says, "I got everything going on here, from a diddle I do to a damn if I know." <laughs> He's like, he's like, I got egg rolls, I got chicken fried rice, I got everything here from a jiggle eye dough to a damn if I know. And he just says some weird nonsense. And I just think, what are you on about? But his character, so the way he did that, his was he took the script, and one day I think he was, I think he was in the U.S. He overheard a white kid talking like that, and he said to the white kid, "Look, come with me. 
um, I'm Gary Oldman, I'm an actor, this is my agent, da, da, da. he said, I'm, I'm I want you, pedo. I want you to read this script in your voice. So he did, and he's like, I wouldn't say it like that. So Gary Oldman was like, right, okay. And he got this, paid this young kid to re help him rewrite the script into like more like slang up, yeah yeah more updated slang and that's how gary Oldman did it and same with brad pitt tony scott congratulated brad pitt because <laughs> tarantino he's had no stoner he said tarantino didn't have any backstory or anything for floyd he just said there's always a man getting stoned on the sofa but brad pitt that hat he's wearing, he found that one day while he's walking. He found it on the beach. He took it and washed it. And he said, I'm going to wear this because I feel like my character wears this. So he, he added all this backstory to this stoner for no reason at all. Like, these people were just were like believed in the script, believed in Tony Scott, and just like, then, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll add this backstory. But yeah, there's a little bit of backstory for Drexel there. But with Drexel, we do uh, open up to the introduction of him before he goes to see him, before he, he decides to go and see him. Cause it's yeah, so we got, we got this. That. We got this opening of Drexel, which is basically uh, the, the bit of Samuel Jackson, if you blink, you miss him scene, where there's just a, like a deal going on, some money, whatever, and uh, Drexel just basically shoots him, kills him. Yeah, he basically tricks them. They're talking about eating eating pussy which is the, the phrase they use in this and gary oldman sort of laughing with these gangsters samuel L. jackson's one of them and then he says oh i'll tell you what though give me that gun a minute i'll show you and so someone just throws gary oldman a shotgun and he just blows them all away and then takes the 200k well it's a million dollars worth of cocaine um and this is the suitcase of cocaine that will be with us now throughout the movie so oh, so did drexel steal it so the he gangsters from those will come in to take it from Drexel anyway. So those gangsters work f uh, Christopher Walken. For Christopher Walken, but Drexel stole it from them. But so that's why Walken's guys, after all of these So Samuel kids. Jackson was working for Christopher Walken. Yeah. They, so Walken's got fingers and many pies in this. So anyway, so Drexel was going to die regardless of any... <laughs> For stealing yeah. that money, uh, that coke. Okay, cool. So, so we basically we've, we found out that he's not a very nice man, and we cut back to Clarence now, and he's just sitting there festering away. You can see it on sitting in the back of his mind. He's just in the background, just like, oh, well, no, I'm not happy about this. And he goes to the bathroom. And this is when we have Elvis pop up. Yeah. So his mentor. So this for me, it would be like Jackie Chan popping up behind me whenever I went went to the loo, and he's there going, "Hey Dan, uh, I believe in you. Go and kill that pimp." I'd be like, all right, thanks, Jackie. I'll go and do that. Well, this is what Elvis says to Christian Slater. He's like, I always liked you, Clarence. I always will. Go get him, boy. I don't, oh. I don't know who would be in the bathroom with me. <laughs> who would it be? But like, thingy from Jaws or something. Um, Hooper! <laughs> <laughs> That's some bad hat, Harry. Him. <laughs> Yeah, one of those guys will say, what are you doing in there? What, what voice are you going to give me? Be the mayor from Jaws. Oh, God. I thought you'd say someone like Tarantino or Rodriguez or Peter Jackson. <laughs> Peter Jackson. I don't know. <laughs> He'd just be there going, all right, give in. <laughs> I think you should go and kill that pimp. I'll kick ass for the Lord. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he says to him, look, he's a piece of shit. Don't worry about it. Go kill him. So he thinks, all right, if Elvis says it, I'll go and do it. So he's a bit deluded, this guy. <laughs> yeah. He's got Elvis in his head. <laughs> so he says to her, I want you to write down your previous address for me. He, he, he's, he's, he's got a gun a bit, as well, we should he's say. He's a bit taxi driver, though. Yeah, like he's got a gun. He's got sunglasses on. Yeah. Well, that's because Tony Scott said to him, you're not in all the rehearsals you're not quite getting what i want you to be like go and watch taxi driver like two or three there times we this weekend I didn't so know that. just before they started shooting he really watched taxi driver over and over again for a few days and was like oh, okay i'm gonna be like robert de niro yeah, yeah. I, I, I could see that actually and he knocks on the door of drexel he says, are you drexel who's uh, asking and he says it's about alabama we go in, and it's quite interesting because he goes in, has this envelope, and basically says, "I'm not here to hang out." Drexel sitting there eating his Chinese food. I'm not here to hang out. Uh, oh, his... I, I, hang on, hang on. Let's let's not just get to that. It's very intimidating scene. We've got techno music playing. Okay. There's very weird lighting in there. There's a 
like a, a black exploitation movie playing on the TV with loads of like tits. Uh, there's a table full it's of the Mac. Chinese food. Yeah, it's the Mac. Mm. Table full of Chinese food. Have you seen the Mac? Yeah, I've seen the Mac. Yep. Dr. Dre sampled uh, from long, it. A long time ago, but I've I've seen it. Yeah. Um, and there's all these gangsters, huge gangsters, definitely guns and drugs in this place. And like you said earlier, the balls on Clarence to walk up in there. Yeah. He says, I want to talk to you about Alabama. And he goes, what has she done now? And he's like, well, she's not done anything, but you're never, you're never to see her again. She's with me now. Who are you? I'm her husband. And he laughs and he says, uh, okay, well, uh, here's what I know about you. You've walked in here and you've not even sat down. You stood there, you're eyeballing me. Now, I'm pretty. I ain't as pretty as those titties on their TV screen. You've not even looked at those titties once since you've been in here. They're not good titties. They're not good titties. And he says, um, so I know that your your tense basically says I'm calling your bluff here and you're not going to do anything. And he says, I'm still a mystery to you, but I know where your white ass is coming from. <laughs> I know. He's really deluded his, his race, isn't he? Yes. And he says, look, I haven't sat down. Christmas letter says, I haven't sat down. Because I, I don't staying. like you. I'm not staying. Yeah, I don't want to eat because I'm not hungry. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason I'm acting like this is because I don't like you. Um, here's an envelope. What's in there is payoff for Alabama. You're not going to get a penny more than what's in that envelope. That's my peace of mind. And that's it. And he opens the envelope. And it's empty. Oh! And this is what I'm saying, though. It's so such a ballsy thing. to just, or he's, just he's basically just stepping into this person's place and giving him shit. And it's like, what are you doing? He definitely wants a fight, but he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to kill him. So he's just like, he's, that's why he's got the balls. Well, Gary Oldman finds this quite amusing. He throws loads of Chinese food at Christian's letter, which distracts him so they get into a bit of a fight. He, he, Gary Oldman looks, tries, the character tries to look really hard by dodging a, fat, a light swing into him. He does it really like, yeah, and jumps to the side and grabs it. And it's like, it's a light shade. <laughs> it's, it's not a yeah. swinging pendulum or something. Well, they have this big fight, um, and he beats the shit out of Christian Slater. But then Christian Slater manages to get the upper hand by headbutting um, his bodyguard, um, Gary Oldman's bodyguard, in the back of the head. Then he manages to fight Drexel off of him. But not for long. They kick his ass. They kick the shit out of him. Um, and he says to him, <laughs> You must have thought it was White Boy Day. Is it White Boy Day, Marvin? It's Marvin's definitely like, not White Boy Day. Like, That's hilarious. Like, but he take, he grabs his wallet and gets his ID, ID out and so gives it to the other guy. And he says, says go, go get Alabama. Yeah, he says, Clarence Worley. And he laughs at his name. And um, yeah, go get Alabama because I know where this guy lives now. So, so bear in mind, audience, listeners, that that driving license is going to remain with Drexel now, which is going to come into play later on for poor old Dennis Hopper. Well, in the other guy's hand. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's in Marvin's hand, that's right. Mm-hmm. Um, because somebody does a bit of a shooting of a groinal area, and that's the end of Gary Oldman and Drexel. Yeah, he shoots him and shoots the then a, gets another girl to go and get a bag and fill it with uh, Alabama's uh, stuff. Yeah, just go get the and she, so she, she must just be really scared. Just grabs any bag and says, "That's it," and gives <laughs> that it. That must to them. be it. It doesn't really give a fuck. She must realise that it's a really heavy, solid suitcase, <laughs> full of a uh, million dollars worth of cocaine. I think so I just hand that away to them. But but Apparently. like this, oh yeah, it's so bad that he just doesn't take his identification where he lives. But he's never done this before. He's not like he is in the other movies. Of course movies. not. And he didn't it's know just... what was going to happen. But he really um, should have, like, you know. Now, this is so Tarantino, this next scene. Because he shows up with loads of hamburgers. He's got his sunglasses on to hide all of his cuts and bruises. And he says, God damn, this is the best fucking hamburger I ever tasted. Do you ever taste a hamburger this good? And she's like, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? And he says, look, I, I killed him. Yeah. I killed Drexel. She cries. <laughs> And he says, he gets angry with her. He says, what? What What you did? What? What you did? What What, what about what I did? It's so romantic. <laughs> and then they just kiss. And it's, just, it's so lovely. So they open the suit, she opens her suitcase because that's good. She can change some clothes. And she, she can't dress. I suppose she could pull over herself and pretend she's in a big dress of cocaine. But she can't really dress in it, really. Yeah. Oops. Um... 
this isn't my stuff. What are we going to do? So they go for the, the dad. Dennis Hopper, an ex-cop, now working as a train, sort of a railway security guard, and a, living in a trailer with a dog. Nick actually on the train tracks. Do you know how loud yeah. that's going to be when you're trying to go to sleep at night? I know. You're, you're, it's just going to completely shake everything in that trailer. So it's 8 a.m. in the morning. He's just finished the night shift by the looks of it. He's going to always get those with a grown guy have a kip. He's like, oh, here's my son who I haven't seen in four years. And he's, he's actually, oh, right, it's your wife. Right, and he this is my wife. He's happy about it at first. He kind of looks at her like, what the fuck? Got any beers, Dad? As he doesn't explain, though, I haven't seen you for years, and you just turn up, and it's like, you're too, going too fast. It's so Dennis Hopper. You're going too fast, man. Just too, too fast. you got to slow down. Like, Says you're just like your fucking mother, you are. Just rush in here. He yeah. said, you turn up here like a tornado, <laughs> and he says, um... Dad, can you drink beer? And he's like, I can drink beer. I choose not to. And he's like, Bama, go get us some beers. Um, I've got to talk to my dad about something. So Alabama goes off to go and get some beers. And he says to his dad, look, I need you to do me a favor. And he, t- he must tell him about Drexel and that kind of stuff. Because his dad's he like, look. I'm in trouble. So for fuck's sake. Imagine, this is all you need is a parent. Thanks, kid. Brilliant. Thanks very much. You know. There's good news and there's bad news, Dad. What's the good news? Good news is I'm married to Alabama here. She's beautiful. What's the bad news? I killed her pimp and his bodyguard. <laughs> yep. I'm on the run with a big suitcase of cocaine. Well, he hasn't told him about the coke. Well, no. But he says to him, I want you to do me a favour and call in to your buddies who still work for the department just to know, find out if they are on to us, if they know what it's about. So he does that and he says, look, they don't. They think it's all drug related. They think Drexel got killed by um, his name is uh, Vincenzo Cucotti. That's Christopher Walken, his men, because he worked for him, and they. He's a piece of shit. And from what it sounds like, son, it sounds like you did the world a favour by getting rid of this guy. He wasn't a nice guy. He had a, a, a file as long as your arm. You've done the good thing here. So he's like, thanks, Dad. And they give each other a really lovely hug. Awkward, but lovely. Yeah. And he says, I love you, son. He says, I love you too, Dad. And it's a really lovely moment. Um, and, yeah, he says, all right, we're going to go now then. All right then, nice to see you for two minutes. See you later. Then we cut to a very quick scene, just an introduction to Michael Rappaport's character, Dick. Dick? Who the fuck is Dick? You want me to suck his dick? <laughs> <laughs> That is just brilliant later on, isn't that it? That is a good line. Yeah. Um, Michael Rappaport. So Dick is a wannabe actor in Hollywood. He's also Christian Slater's best friend from back in the day. But he is um, going for a part in TJ Hooker with William Shatner. <laughs> and he goes in and the woman's like, OK, pretend you're driving a car. Um, William Shatner's on the hood. And he's like, oh, no. What is that guy doing on the hood of the car? Get him off. She's like, okay, thanks, bye. <laughs> he's shit. It's like Joey from Friends whenever he went for an audition. Yeah. It's like one of those deals. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all we get to see of him for now, but it's funny. Funny little scene, and uh, he plays quite a sweet character in this. Um, so what happens next? Oh, yeah, Dennis Hopper. Um, well, oh, we've well, already done well, that. Well, no, Slater's, um, Christian Slater's rang up him at the side of the road. That's where they make love. That's right. And he says, I'm coming to LA. And he says, what? I haven't heard of you for ages. Oh, my God, Axon. Whoa, that's really cool. Um, look how, uh, did you get the envelope that I sent? What envelope? Yeah. Floyd smokes all my mail normally. <laughs> yeah. He must be He must be roaching all the letters and stuff. He's like, okay, well, look, have you, I've sent you a letter. You Go smoked? check it. Just regular paper is not nice. No, it's not. Yeah. I've been, been desperate when I was a youth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all been there. We've all smoked all the walls. Yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so, so, says that they've got an envelope coming. What, what was in the envelope? I can't remember now. It's just a letter explaining the situation. Oh, OK, fine. Um, and then they just start having sex in the phone box while the yeah. top goes by. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would blow my horn as well. Well, I think Christian Slater blew his horn. Um, they, yeah, they've told him that they're on their way, and he's like, "This is my wife." She's like, "Nice to meet you. I've heard so much about you, Dick." And he's like, "I can't believe we got married." And yeah, that that scene ends with, "God damn it, Floyd, you used up all the toilet paper." Yeah, Brad Pitt's done the shit. 
<laughs> Brad shit. Brad shit, and he's used it all up. Yeah, poor old Michael Rappaport. Um, so, Dad gets home from his next shift, and there's about a dozen Sicilian gangsters in his trailer. Yeah, this is a really good scene. Like, really, really good scene. Like, just the, these two, just the way they go at it with each other. It's so intense because they know what's happening the whole time. We know what's going to happen. They both know what's going to happen. They're both mature old people who've been around in the world long enough, and it's played so one, amazingly One was a cop. Well. Yeah. One was a cop. One, was, one is a gangster. Yeah, they, they, they know they what's going on. each other. He knows that he's fucked and he's going to be killed. Chris he Walker knows that knows they're there, him, but he's still giving him that respect, saying, "You know, oh, you want a cigarette and stuff." But we, we, let's, let's talk about the scene. Let's go for it. He says, "Would you like a Winchester?" And he's like, "No, thank you." And he's like, "Okay." So explain the scene. Explain what's happened. So they basically sit down, Dennis Hopper, and say to Chris Walker, and says, "Look, here's and, the deal." And, and and what's the what's the setting? What's going on? In his trailer. Yeah, there's, there's all these gangsters all around him. He's basically stuck there. He doesn't have a choice. He can't do That's what I say. He's it. walked in and there's a dozen Sicilian gangsters and it's, it's in this. And like, sit down. There's one, one directly behind him. And then you've got the big boss there in the long coat and the gloves. It's Christopher Walken. And the way he talks. And he's so intimidating. Yeah. Um, and he says to him, you know, can I give you a cigarette? And he's like, no, not right now. He's like, okay. Well, he's basically... I am the Antichrist, and all the angels in heaven... He's so terrifying and intense. And he says, you do not even want to know the shit I could bring down on you. All I want to know is where your son and that whore that he's hanging around with... I just want to know where they are. So, can you tell me? And he's like, I haven't seen my son in uh, about four years. He says, okay, okay. Look at that. Look at that. And then he just punches him in the nose. And he says, oh, that would, hurts a bit, doesn't it? Would they um, kill him if he'd if it given him up? Been like, yep, yeah, that's him. That's the address on the fridge. Would they have killed him? I think they would have killed him. Mm. I think I think they were going to kill him anyway, because they, they don't fuck around trace, these guys. can they? You no. can't leave a trace of, like, the, because of what they're after. So he says to him, look. I want to tell you something. I'm Sicilian. My father was Sicilian. He was a great liar. Is and he it? told me about the 17 pantomimes of lying. Women have 20, men have 17. And I've seen several from you there. So I'm going to ask you again, because that broken nose you've got is as good as it's going to get from me. And it won't get any, it will never be as good. So again, your son. So this is where Dennis Hopper's character has to do some good acting. So he tells a story, but it's not the right story. He says, I haven't seen him for years. He turns up here yesterday with some girl. He says he's married. Um, they asked for money. I gave him $500. They didn't tell me where they were going. I didn't think to ask. Okay. And he says, okay, right. But he doesn't, he, he reading him, doesn't believe him. He still doesn't believe him. Hmm. So he's got this broken nose, and they cut his hand. Uh, it's um, what's his name that does it? Um, James Gandolfini slices his hand and pours something on it that's going to really sting. I don't know what it is, lighter fluid or something. And he says, um, "Can I have that cigarette now?" And he says, "Yeah." And Dennis Hopper then basically, there's a lot of racial slurs in this bit, which we're not obviously going to say. But, but this is where because Christopher Walken has the power. This whole scene, we we're sitting there. He has the power. Dennis Hopper is powerless. Absolutely, no. Physically power. powerless, but everywhere at this point here, he literally takes the power into his own hands, and what he says literally stops Christopher Walken's train of thought of what he's doing, and completely takes him from it. And like, what the fuck? And the the, the, the that audacity and the disrespect he he's, he feels from this uh, in front of his people as well he knows he's doomed so he thinks if i'm going down i'm going to go down saying the worst stuff i can so ever say this is why this scene is so good because he knows he's gonna die the other one knows he's gonna kill him. but i love the fact that he pulls christopher walken's power away from him for that moment and he's like and the, what the fuck and tarantino wrote this scene because this happened in real life <clears throat> a roommate of his a black guy and a Sicilian guy were having a conversation, and the black guy told the Sicilian guy this same story. Oh, really? Um, so he wrote that in, into the script. Um, but you guys will, I'm sure, will know the scene if you haven't seen it. 
go Google it. Okay, YouTube it. I'm, we're not going to get into the amazing. details. It's an amazing scene. Yeah. Um, and it pisses Christopher Walken off so much that he gets his gun. He laughs, gives him a kiss. Then he gets his gun. The typical gangster fashion gives him a kiss. Then he shoots him twice in the head and then just empties the barrel into Dennis Hopper. So It's just when he takes that, when he starts realising what he's saying to him, and it's so powerful to him, and Christopher Walken's just like... I... And he just doesn't know what to do. So his reactions is to look to his guys and laugh. So of course they all they all laugh as well. And they're just like, uh, what? And then he starts like, oh, what? And he kisses him on the face, the face, and just uh, and looks at him and then looks back at him. And looks he goes, at him you. And it, he always pinches his cheek like oh, you. I like you. I like you. That sort of thing. He does say, doesn't he? I love this guy. I love this guy. Yeah. And it's just like he turns around at that point. Then when he turns around. It's so incredibly done because at that point then you feel for Dennis Hopper who is just sitting there going, I've got the next 10 seconds left till I die. I'm going to have this cigarette. Dennis it's Hopper... A smoking a cigarette, enjoying it. When this scene was shot, Dennis Hopper was asked if he wanted earplugs. And he said, um, I don't know, Chris, are you wearing them? He said, no, no, I won't wear earplugs. <laughs> um... <laughs> And Dennis Hopper regretted that because he couldn't hear for about two days properly after this scene. Yeah. Because the gun earplugs. firing. I don't care if Chris were walking and wearing earplugs. Fuck your own ears up, Chris. <laughs> well, after, ironically, and after they've killed him. They did Chris walk and he says, he said, I love the fact that he said, your fuckhead son left his driver's license in a dead guy's head. <laughs> so <laughs> your funny. fuckhead son. Your fuckhead son. <laughs> and uh, and he's I love that he says that, and he says um, uh, he draws a purple Cadillac, and I was thinking it's a pink Cadillac. And then later on, I couldn't decide, and I was like, I think it's a pink purple Cadillac. It's a he mixture. Says, Listen, we spoke to your neighbours, okay? They told son. us about the Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. It arrived, <laughs> <laughs> so we know your son's been here. Ironically, after they kill him. They find the fucking address on the fridge. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, they've got it. Bask, it's just going to be a good day for you, or whatever he says to him. Oh, so poor old Dick's address is on the fridge. Yeah. Which is where they're headed. So, L.A., we're in L.A., Gav. Du, 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 driving down L.A. And, um, yeah, Clarence and Alabama show up. At Dick's, they knock on the door. Hey, they're really excited to see each other. Woo! Floyd's on the sofa. He's on the sofa like, hey, hey, man, how you doing? <laughs> um, they're so excited to see each other that they take um, Dick in his underwear and T-shirt that he slept in off for for dinner <laughs> or breakfast. <laughs> and he just goes with it. He's like, yeah, okay. I got an audition on TJ Hooker. And he's like, you're gonna, you met Captain Kirk? No, no, I didn't get to meet him, but I might do. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's like, what is going on here? It's so good. You really like, the dialogue really makes this film, doesn't it? My note now says that Cadillac is pink. I kind of like it's pink. It's pur 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 purpley pink, isn't it? It's purpley pink. They check into a hotel. Um, they show him, show Dick all the coke. Yeah, and they say, look at this. And he said, so you killed Drexel? And he's like, no, it's not Drexel's coke. It's Clarence's coke. And it's like, okay. And he's like, look, this is it, Dick. You are a big Hollywood actor. He's not at all. And we know you've got connections. He doesn't at all. <laughs> we think we just want to get rid of this in one go. So we want you to contact someone in Hollywood and I'll sell this for 200 K. I do know a guy. He says, yeah, he's like, I do know one guy. His name's Elliot Blitzer. He works for a top producer, but I'm not like, I'm not, I haven't made it yet. I'm auditioning for TJ hooker. And I don't, don't even know if I've got that yet. And they're like, look, please, you've got to help us with this. You've got to help us with this. It's okay, yeah, there's one guy I know who might be able to help you out. So this is where they they go and meet him at the roller coaster, don't they? Uh, Elliot Blitzer, the first time we meet him, and he's um he's played by um Bronson Pinchot, I think you say his name. We've seen him in loads of movies, never knew his name. And it's a really good way to do a drug deal on a roller coaster because there's no, no one can hear you only the person you're sat next to oh yeah it's actually really well they're not doing a deal they're just discussing it 
Um, but it's really interesting way to do it because he's asking loads of questions on the uphill of the uh, roller coaster. And he's not, because he's saying, where'd you get the coke from? And he, he needs a, he's like a story. So Clarence has this story that he has this police contact who went in the the, uh, the uh, evidence locker, stole it and got away with it. And he's been sitting on it for a couple of years or whatever. And now he wants to get rid of it in one go. Yeah, and, and he's, he's not a dirty cop. He can't he's start desperate. arguing this so much because he's about to go down the roller coaster. And he's like, ah! So it's a really good place and way of doing it. It's very sneaky, actually. Um, And in real life, Michael Rappaport was the one that was really, really sick. He was actually really not allergic to roller coasters, but he can't go on them. Oh, so really? he had to, he had to for this movie and just spent after every take, just throwing up because he just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't deal with it. Mm-hmm. But it's actually Elliot Blitzer that's, that's throwing up in this one. He actually starts crying, doesn't he? Elliot, as they get towards the end of it, yeah. which kind of forces him into saying yes to the deal, really. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so yeah, that's it. So he gives a bit more of a sales pitch when they get off the roller coaster, and he says, "All right, I'm going to call Lee now, Lee being the producer, uh, and he's on. He's driving along, coked out of his brain in his Porsche." <laughs> but at what, at what point, though? Is it because <laughs> like death? Because he went and killed someone. At what point did Christian Slater? Because is it because he t- had fell in love? Turns into this bad boy gangster where he goes around killing people and making multi million deals with Hollywood producers co but, he, deals. but he's not he, he says this later guy. yeah exactly he's not he's not that guy he and he even says that later on when he speaks to Lee he, in when in the hotel room he says look I I'm not that guy I just got this I need to shift it so that me and Alabama can just go about our d- lives because we're in love we just got married we've got our whole lives ahead of us mm. so he's not that guy at all he's just in a situation he wants to get out of it's not like very bad things where he's making it worse just by killing more and more and more people mm. he just wants this situation done and he wants that's why he's selling it for such a low price you know he could he yeah. could sell it bit by bit and cut it because it's uncut Gav let's not forget this is rural uncut fucking cocaine this is like the best nose candy you can get but he's willing to take 200k for it because he just wants it done and dusted meaning he is a good guy he just wants it done but but that money would be great and that's enough money for him back in the day then as well so quite a few years ago that would probably in an american currency as well that would probably do all right for him in alabama and get away yeah well, Lee and Slater speak on the phone of his Porsche phone, Slater, Lee's Porsche phone, because he's got a Porsche, you know. He's, and they, they use movie metaphors. Uh, Dr. It, Zhivago, it's very good. Yeah. He's like, he I've says got... to him, what, why are you ring me up on a Sunday? I don't get it. Elliot, what are you doing? No, no, we're not talking this now on the phone. Oh, my God. He gets so stressed by him. And he basically says, <laughs> look, I've got a, another script that I think you could produce. And he's like, this is, this could be your Dr. Shivago. It's that big. And he's like, I usually just produce smaller, low-budget movies, but I'm willing to discuss your script, potentially. So it's all really good, because just in case the, the feds are listening in, they could just be talking about movie scripts. It's very good. Very well done. Um, and then afterwards, he sort of goes along with it and thinks he's all right. Okay, so I'll put a deal with with Elliot put Elliot back on the phone and this and is says, where we just yeah it's so <laughs> funny so. this is where he says who's the other guy he's like oh that's Dick who the fuck is Dick no we don't hear that we we just don't hear that at all we just hear Elliot's point of view we don't hear the other side and he says oh oh that, that's uh, that's the Dick and he's like, that's what? Dick he's an actor what you want and he's uh, quite he can't answer voice time but what, what you want me to suck his dick like, oh who the fuck is Dick <laughs> It's so good. I love the fact that he coins his voice to say, "Oh, you want me to suck his?" Because like, he probably like, he's he, like, "Do I?" Do oh no, I do like that? like to the point where he's like, "What? What is this? Like, we're gonna have a discuss?" Okay, well, well let's quiet down if we could discuss this. So what? What are you quieting down? <laughs> <laughs> um, and they agreed to meet at Wednesday at three o'clock in the hotel, and he's gonna bring the whole cast. Very in, good. As in, as in the suitcase. Um, <laughs> James, uh, uh, um, what's it called? James, James Gandolfini. He goes to, uh, uh, goes, if, goes basically, finds out where he's going, goes to uh, uh, Dick's house, and uh, finds Lloyd. Floyd. It's Floyd. Floyd's, Floyd's on the sofa. On the sofa. Chilling and out. he's like, he sees him looking, and he's like, whoa, hey. And he's like, hi, <laughs> are you Dick? 
No. Do you know where Dick is? Uh, yes, I do. They're at the so and so hotel. Da da da. And he's like, okay. He's like, you want to come watch some TV with me? No, but I might be back. Ah, oh, cool. And then he, as he walks off, he goes, "You fucking condescending me." I am fucking, and he sort of mutters to himself, like yeah. sort of stoned, yeah. paranoid a little bit, but yeah, also funny. really stoned as well. I don't think paranoid. He's just, he's just like, yeah, fucking, I'm um, fucking talk to me that, that. Just mutters himself on his breath. It's quite funny. Um, they pull up outside the hotel, and Christian Slayer says, "I'm going to go grab some burgers." That's all they seem to eat. Um, Bama, you go in, and she's like, I'm going to go inside, I'm going to have a bubble bath, watch one of those skin flicks and get myself all ready for you. And he's like, cool, I'm going to get some hamburgers and I'll be right back, baby. Yeah, how she can do all that in that time, have a bath that way, just go to get burgers. That's very slow bath, or quick bath. Yeah, well, you know, you don't know where the burgers are coming from. Because he goes to that, well, he ends up talking to that guy for ages, doesn't he? So while he's getting Still the burgers... The man's reading a magazine. He says that magazine has got the single best article I've ever read on Elvis Presley. It covers the highs, the lows, all the different parts of his career. It even covers the fanatics. Look at these guys; they are crazy. And then the guys say, "Oh yeah, see what you mean." And the guy ends up talking to him about Elvis as well. It's like yeah. he's such a likable character that you just talk to him about about Elvis. I'm surprised he didn't say, "Would you uh, would you ever fuck Elvis?" Because I would. I'm surprised. Yeah. I suppose he didn't say that. Now, while he's getting this burger and chatting to this guy oh, about no, Elvis. Brad Pitt, very quickly, Brad Pitt, when he says, kind of send it, he, what he said, might assume himself on, he says, I'll kill you, man. <laughs> <laughs> he can't even say condescending right, though, I think. Send me, I'll kill you, man. I'll kill you, man. Yeah. What's it? And he had, a, he had lived all of his dialogue, Brad Pitt. Oh, nice. No. He had lived all of it and you know he brought this character to life there was nothing written for him really just a slob line on the sofa but yeah, brad pitt turned him into this funny little minute tiny little character Alabama um, gets back to the hotel goes in the room does. and who's sitting in the chair with a big shotgun virgil aka james gandolfini yeah. and, and he's, he's quite this, a menacing character isn't he he's big and a big guy just, just T- Tony Soprano, is. you know, we, we no, know I've never seen Soprano. Yeah, me neither, but I know, I do know that, you know, obviously that's it's probably his most famous role. Um, mm. And he's got that, he's got that way of talking. He's a bit Robert De Niro as well, isn't he? And that's, yeah, it's just the way he really beats on this woman. It's well, he says to her, hi, Alabama. She's like, uh, who are you? And he sort of says, Where's Clarence? She said, I think you've got the wrong room. My boyfriend's at football practice and he'll be back in a minute. And you can tell that she's, she, just like Dennis Hopper, she's like thinking, I am fucked. But I'm going to try my best to talk my way out of this. Yeah. I know this situation is going to go really badly. Um, she says, oh, where's our coke? We know you've got it. And she's like, I don't know, we don't have coke, but there's a Pepsi machine down the hall. Good, well done. You try and yeah, well, he punches her out though. He says, "Can you? Can I just take your glasses off? I just want to take a look at you." Oh wow, yeah, very pretty. Yeah. Bam. Yeah. And yeah, he beats her and he beats her and he beats her and it's quite hard she to watch. Won't say and he keeps doing it. Yeah, it's really hard to watch. Actually. However, the uh, MPAA or whatever they're called were really wanted this scene trimmed down. What they wanted trimmed down was the parts where she hits him. Because they said she was too animalistic. Not the bit where the man's beating the woman up. Mm-hmm. The bit where she's smashing him in the head with a toilet top. And, you know. But she gives as good as she gets. Um, He's not talking are... about the fir- her first kill. You know, it's not like when you first kill someone, it's the hardest one. Oh, it's so Tarantino, isn't it? In the middle of a fight, just sitting down and saying, the first one I threw up after it. The second one... It's not as bad. The third one is where I leveled off. Now, now I just kill people just to watch their faces change. Mm. And it's like, this guy is a stone cold killer. Mm. You know, she gets a corkscrew. Do you know about the ice man? Uh, the gangs, um, the, like the mafia's hard killer. Mm, no, no. Tell me. Uh, it was just this guy. He, he was just, he had like a family and that, but he was just a hard killer from um, gangsters and that mafia and stuff in america and he was just cold that's why i called him um, like ice cold or whatever 
it's just super like no emotion you can there's a load of interview tapes with him and you can on youtube and you can watch him talking and his voice is so calm he's talking about the killings and death it's so calm so calm but for him it's just literally it's a job i go out i kill people and that's it Who i come home to my family and i'm done and he said they'll never do children or i think women maybe I'm not sure and it was literally a job for him and it's very much like this it's the ice man i think it is um there was a movie actually made of it as well uh, yeah Car. dude is just gnarly but check it out though on youtube <clears throat> well she pulls a corkscrew out and um he's like you've got a lot of heart kid you've got a lot of heart and then he spots under the bed uh, well he says i'll give you a chance go on he rips his shirt go on let you have one go one go and then he stick spot, it in me then, but then he spots the cocaine oh my god this whole time it's under the bed i didn't look under the bed i don't believe it and then she stabs him in the foot oh yeah. that's gonna hurt yeah which makes him lose his shit and he really throws her around the room now she goes through the shower she ends up in the bath but like dennis hopper again she uses her sharp tongue because she starts laughing at him yeah what, what the hell off, are you laughing puts at him off, puts him off guard and then yeah, base and toilet base in his head, and then just get the classic deodorant and light in the face yeah then she grabs a shotgun and she blows him away his own shotgun and kills him and so yeah it's just and at this point though we cut to elliot get, <laughs> getting picked up for speeding well, having oh. a blowjob. This is pretty. Again, it's a lot of coke. You know, this is Hollywood. This guy's driving along. He's laughing <laughs> because he's getting his dick sucked by his, his girlfriend, we, we, who pops up her head up um, when the police car whoop, whoop, he's behind them. He's driving really fast, uh, and you can't drive very fast when that's happening. It is very distracting. <laughs> and he's got a sample bag from Clarence of coke, so it's a huge amount of uncut cocaine in his pocket mm. that he's obviously sampled. Mm. Um, so he says to her, right, okay, look, I, please hold on to this, put it in your purse. She's like, I'm not holding on to that. He says, look, they're not going to search you. You didn't do anything wrong. I'm the one that was speeding. Put it in your bra, put it in your purse. She's like, no, and they fight, and the bag splits, and it just goes all over his face. And apparently he ad-libbed this line when the cop comes over, and he says, hello, officer, how can I help? <laughs> He's just got cocaine all over it's him. Okay. She laughs him as well. She's laughing, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, He's then interviewed by the cops, um, and this is where we've got the, um, uh, we've got Chris Penn and Tom Sizemore double bill. What I like to call bad cop, bad cop, Gav. Yeah, <laughs> they are both they fucking... are intense. They are <laughs> in his face on both sides, not giving him a second. Imagine that. Because the... those two guys are very screamy shouty anyway, aren't well, they? Is... Rest, rest in peace to both of them, actually. This is well. the trouble of interrogation rooms with police, because they can do get you going for like 17 hours at a time, sleep for a little bit, get you going again for days on end. Um, and even if you are completely enough the innocent, and it's been done many, many times and will be done again, they can break you down so much that you will sign a confession. Actually, you Tom know? Sizemore isn't dead. I do take that back. Tom Sizemore's not dead. Chris Penn's dead. Yeah, but they, yeah, you're right. They scream yeah, at him, Sizemore's scream at him. doing loads of movies because we talked about him very recently in the old uh, Relic. Relic. And um, basically, they say to him, This is what you're facing. You're facing jail, you know, that all the horrible things that come with jail. And, you know, the, and they go and t speak to the boss and they say, look, and he'll wear... Yeah, explain to the boss that they've got this... And it's this old cop from another thing. And because it's, they're saying this whole story of these cops and stuff, and it's an internal thing, they're like, we've got to get this, can't have bad cops, do you know what I mean? So it's All because it of this lie. thing, because Christian Slater just made this story up. So they say to so him, funny. look, this guy works for um, Lee Donowitz, the huge movie producer, and... If we can... And they all like his movie. He did a war movie. Yeah, body bag. Uh, coming home in a body bag. Yeah, and they all like it's a good fucking movie. It's a good, good it's a fucking good movie. movie. It's a good movie. They really like... In fact, they steal the show almost towards the end. Chris Penn and... Um, yeah, you know, I really like him in this. When they're, when they're listening in, they're going, I fucking like this kid. He's got balls. Again, this guy's though, hilarious. All these actors in this movie, but some of them not in from for that long. Yeah, it's good. So they basically, the plot is going to be that they're going to get Elliot to wear a wire to this drug deal mm. so that they can catch Lee. Then he can go to jail. 
Elliot won't go to jail. He'll just have whatever happens. He'll probably lose his job, but he won't go to jail because he's helped the cops. But then off the back of all of that, they're going to hopefully then catch the dirty cop that originally yeah, yeah, yeah. The came from, who doesn't exist Yeah, because um, it was Drexel. So their boss is like, okay, they'll do it. And they're like, we just want the credit for this because this is our bust. And he's like, yep, okay, you guys go. Go ahead and do this. It sounds sounds good to me. So that is their mission. That is their um their plan. Oh, you gotta catch your breath because it's uh There's a lot going on. It's a great really good uh build up basically. It's really sort of building up and up and we know what's going on. It's like at some point this is all gonna just go as a climax of it all happening at once, which it does. So Clarence finds Alabama and he patches her up. Um and they discuss going traveling and going to see Europe and they want to see the world together. Meanwhile, back at Dick, they speak to Dick. And Dick gets a phone call. He's got the part. Yeah. He got the part on DJ Hooker, probably because Elliot pulled some strings who he's friends with. But it's never said, but he got the part because off the back of that audition alone, he didn't get the part. No. Um, we cut to some Sicilian gangsters loading their guns. Yeah, where, are they in the same hotel? Or um, they're, somewhere else? they're somewhere else. They're somewhere else. They're into the foyer, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're getting ready. They know where they, they are. They must be nearby or whatever. But yeah, they, I love this because we've got this whole story going on. And we just cut back to just to remind us we've got this side story which is going to be ahead of the story with, with all of the stories, all the root of it. So all come together. And all these gangsters just loading loads and loads of guns. Just that, <laughs> and you you never you never see Christopher Walken again after this. But it doesn't matter because his yeah. his dudes are everywhere. Yeah. Um, Sean, uh, Christopher how Penn they, and how do they know where to go? Um, well, in a minute they go and see Floyd, don't they? Oh, um, Floyd says because where they're oh, going yeah, at the moment, course. they're going they're to Dick's house because they must have gone right. Okay. So Penn and Sizemore are prepping Elliot with the wire. He's very very nervous. So hang on, they send. James Gelfried, Gel, they sent they sent Gandalf. Gandalf, James Gandalf. You shall not pass to there already. But yeah. maybe they didn't hear from him because he then went to that hotel and probably didn't yeah. tell them. He got killed. And he got killed. So they've gone there to look see well, where the fuck's he gone. But they've all gone because they're like, oh, that's not good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so Penn and Sizemore are prepping Elliot with the wire. Um, and they're saying, you don't want to go to jail, do you? And he's like, no. So he says, okay, just talk normally, just talk normally. Um, and he's a really they're... happy guy who's the audio receiver in a background with a white shirt. Like, yeah, yeah, with a <laughs> thumbs up in the background. He's like, calm down. Stop overacting your, your background part there. He says to him, we don't want you in jail, Elliot. We want your boss in jail. That's why we're doing this. Yeah. And Eddie um, kind of just makes some jokes when he's doing the audio test. And one of the guys, uh, I think it's like... Uh, Tom Sawyer's more like, I like this guy, he's funny, huh? and it's quite an intense scene in there. Like everyone's like in this movie's quite intense, apart from apart from Brad Pitt stoning herself. Yeah, a lot of cocaine. Um, yeah. Alabama, I reckon tells... probably on set as well. I should imagine so. Mm. Al- Alabama tells Dick. Well, I mean, let's look at this: Christian Slater, Val Kilmer, Brad. Well, not maybe not Brad Pitt, Christopher Walken, Michael Rappaport. Samuel Jackson definitely had a habit back in the day. These, some of these guys, Dennis Hopper alone, we've heard the stories from him. There's yeah. a lot of good game on this set. Yeah. Alabama has told Dick that her injuries are from playing basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an extreme basketball game that she's had there. <laughs> but they, they pull up um, at the hotel and they meet Elliot in the foyer in the reception. And they're going to do this deal. They're going to go meet Lee, and they get in the lift. The cops are listening in to all of this. You know, who is this guy, huh? And then Clarence... This is makes... where Clarence pulls, pulls a bit of a mind fuck on him. Yeah, and he pulls a gun on him, and he says, Am I a fucking idiot? Do you think I'm a fucking idiot? I want to hear you say, Clarence, you're a fucking idiot. Mm. And the cop's like, is he bluffing? He's bluffing. He must be bluffing. Mm. And Elliot says, oh, I wish somebody would come and take me away and come and rescue me. i got to give it to him because I thought he would have cracked easy. And the and, cops are thinking that as well. And he doesn't. And then he picks him up and he gives him a hug. And, it's, and Elliot hugs and they laugh. And it's kind of a weird, weird freak out moment, really, that I think um, he, was he was just testing him to mm-hmm. see if he was, you know, because he says, I just want to know what I'm walking into when we go in there. Mm-hmm. And and 
because he didn't break, it's fine. Um, Sizemore, I like this guy, he's crazy. Um, then we get cut back to Floyd, and he's doing a bong. Doing a bong, <laughs> and the bad guys turn up. Not about, what you need. About 20 Sicilians with guns turn up, and he goes, he goes, whoa! <laughs> it's kind of like my son when, I don't know, like a, a, a bin lorry goes down the road, and he goes, wow! Oh, it's the same sort of expression. He's just like, whoa, and he just kind of puts his finger up like, laughing. Ah, look at you guys. I, I, I imagine I've been staying that perhaps back in the day when I was a kid, you know, like smoking weed, but I don't know. He's pretty full on. He answers all their questions like a good little boy because he's had people, he just, all the way through this, people are like, Floyd, where's this? Floyd, where's that? So this time he's like, okay, my name is Floyd, not Dick. I know where Clarence and Alabama are. And he tells them all the answers to their questions. He does, but it's one of those things. If Floyd hadn't done that, the cops would have still got them and they would have been arrested. Yeah. But because the gangs have come, that helps him get away, but he does get blinded. But, you know. So, yeah, he tells them which hotel to go to. So we now get to meet big producer Lee. <clears throat> yep. So let, let's paint the scene it's that, sort got, of, it's that classic. It's, it's a massive hotel room where he's got one of his movies playing. On he's got the, the wall, dailies. The well, it's the, it's the yeah, dailies yeah. of Body Bag Two, which is the sequel being to his, his being big shot movie. At the moment. And he's in there. He's got his big, these big, massive guys with like semi-automatic machine guns as his bouncers. These guys are like, um, they're like, like the guys that take over Naka time. I was going to say they're like Hans Gruber's men, aren't yeah, they? They've yeah. got semi-automatic machine guns, so they walk in and he says. Boss, this guy's got to go. He's like, I don't want to, I don't care about that. Be nice to them, Horace. Make them a coffee. Nice to meet you. And he goes, oh, Mr. Uh, Donowitz, please don't insult me. Call me Lee. And actually, Lee and Clarence really like each other because L- Clarence is a massive film fan. He starts listing off his favorite films, his favorite Vietnam movies. He genuinely likes coming home in a body bag. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, Lee, and then he tells them a story. He says, I actually have two friends who were in Nam, and, and they've told the me... Goddamn, true to life Vietnam movie there is. Yeah. And Lee says, can I tell you, that genuinely touches me to know that my art but has, then, you know, made them feel like that. And he's like, right, anyway, get on with this. What's going on? And he's like, come on, let me see the, see the stuff. Let me see Dr. Chivago. Yeah. So, um, and they haven't shows directly it. said it yet, and 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 uh, it's not Dick, though, is it? Who is it? Um, thinking with the water. Uh, Elliot. Elliot's there, just kind of, just the whole time, just Sweating. like a bad smell, just kind of near them, so like it, they can hear on the mic. He said, "Who the fuck is this guy? This is Dick, the actor." Oh, I hear you're quite talented. He doesn't really care about him. He's like, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, they discussed the dailies that were being on the TV. Meanwhile, the Sicilians enter the reception downstairs. Things aren't going well here. We got cops, we got Sicilian gangsters, and then we've got the drug deal with their bodyguards and machine guns as well. So we've got three little parties going on here that are all going to meet up. Mm. Cut to Lee doing a big, big old fat line. <laughs> he says, "Now that is not nose garbage." No. <laughs> He says, this is very, very good. Where did you get it? And he tells him it was from... Yeah. And he says, um, he believes him, you know, because Clarence is a charming guy, so he believes him. We do cut to the cops now getting ready to, like, go in there, just waiting for, like, someone to say, like, like, good evidence, basically. Yeah. And he says, then you hear him say, okay, Horace, get the money, I'll buy it. And that's where the cops are like, yeah! At this, yes. at this point, though, just in between that, the gangsters have just turned up the hotel reception, just to, just to remind us that the gangsters are still about to approach, which is just not good. But it's, that's why it's such a good climax for a, a viewer. And meanwhile, the, the cops start to move in as well with their guns. Yeah, um, I know, that's the beauty of it. It's just like, oh my god, this is going to be good. Clarence goes to the bathroom, and he's you know he's doing the deal of his life here. And Elvis shows up behind him again and says, "You're doing a good thing." You know, you and Alabama are good. I've always liked you, Clarence. I always will. Rock and roll, whatever he says. And uh, while he's in the bathroom, of course, this is where the cops arrive. Mm. 
everybody put your fucking guns down and the the, the henchmen of Lee are like no you put your fucking guns it's down two of them have a lot more cops and they're like no we're not doing it and and he's saying to them like put your guns down what are you doing guys you, oh, you work for me and they're like Lee it's like I never told you but I fucking hate cops I know and they're like, we could kill you all with these machine guns. And they're like, put your guns down, put your guns down. And the sort of, it's all very sort of, oh, who's going to shoot first? Who's going to shoot first? It's just, oh God, guns. And in the middle of all this shouting, the Sicilians kick the other door into the hotel suite. And it's like, who the fuck are you guys? Who the fuck are you guys? Like, oh my God. And we've got this three-way standoff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think one of my favorite moments now is where Elliot says, um, he says, uh, Officer Dimes, Officer Dimes, really quietly. He goes, Officer Dimes, so and then everyone, Lee, everybody it, stops, stops talking. Because it, 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 basically, goes, the, well, hang on, it's that whole t that whole thing where everyone's pointing guns at each other. You've got four walls. You've got three walls which are uh, against um, guns, bouncers, cops, drug de uh, gangsters. Then you've got the other people who are just there, the producer, Christian Slater, Alabama, just there, like, uh, and they're Dick. all against each other. And it's really like, everyone's, like, whoa, 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 and the gun's back and forth. It's getting very, it's that sort of thing where someone accidentally sneezes or coughs. Everyone's going to shoot each other. It's Boss so the Vietnam close. Movie is playing on a yeah, drink it's so intense. And some of them can be coked up as well. It's so intense. And that's when, you, like you say again, um, Officer Dimes. Dimes. And then oh, everyone uh, quiet and stands. He says, thing. "What is it, Elliot?" And like, that's, what, that's when there's a How, How do you two know, know each other? other? That's it. You will never work in this business again, Elliot. He said. He says, "I treated you like a fucking son, and you stabbed me in the heart. How could you do this, Elliot? How could you do this?" Then he throws a pot of coffee in his face, which then causes the cops to shoot Lee in the chest, and then the guns just start opening up, yeah. and it's. It's yeah, all it. against all. It's open bang, season. bang, 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 bang. Everyone's getting taken out. Clarence is shot in the eye. Clarence is shot. Well, we don't know that initially. Well, no, we can't shot. He's shot in the head. So we imagine that he's dead. We think he's dead. And in the original script, he did die, like I say. Um, but Tony Scott did change that, which Tarantino did approve of. One of the gangsters kind of gets away and just takes a hostage in the in the hotel. And yeah, a like random the girl. There, over there, and it's just like a whole hostage situation. Come out of it. It's like... What the fuck? The big guy with the ponytail, the, the bodyguard, is sort of going, I need I need an ambulance! I need an ambulance! And so one of the cops goes over and shoots him. He says to him, who, uh, he says, I'll call it? you a hearse. Is it Tom Sizemore does it, doesn't it? No, it's um, Chris Penny. He says, I'll call you a hearse. This one's for whatever his buddy is that got shot in the stomach, and he blows him away. Oh, but it's, then... It's Tom Sizemore gets shot, shot, yeah. And then Alabama blows she Chris blows Penn him. away. Yeah. Um, Picks up... And then, uh, uh, yeah, she goes over to Clarence, thinking he's dead, but he's, he kind of comes to it. So she picks him up and they stumble out. He puts on a pair of sunglasses. He's been yeah. shot in the head. And they stumble out of the hotel. Pass, and are distracted by the fucking hostage situation. They manage to get away. Hang on, just to make this scene even more tense, we forgot to mention the bit where Dick throws the giant suitcase full of cocaine up in the air. They all shoot that, so the room is now showered in it's snowing cocaine and feathers out of all of the pillows, because there's feathers and pillows and cocaine everywhere. And Dick escapes, thank God Michael Rappaport gets away, because I'd have hated it if he'd have been killed. Oh, he never he? would have been on TJ. Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah, runs he off down the corridor. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right, they, they get away, they come outside, they get in the car, and she she drives off, and um, they stop, and she patches him up, and it turns out he lost his eye. Uh, they take the money and run. That last Sicilian guy, um, I think he gets killed, doesn't he? Or do we not see what happens to him, do we? I, no, I imagine he gets shot. I think you hear, I think you hear shooting uh, when they're outside. And yeah, she drives it, the car away, yeah. and then we just get a voiceover, and they're on they're the in Mexico on mm -hmm. the beach, mm -hmm. and she says, similar to what she said at the beginning, and I never dreamed that I'd find true love in Detroit, and I don't know what I'd have done if Clarence died that day, but he didn't. But what I do know is he always asks me that, and I always say the same thing, which is I never would have called our son. Elvis, and that is Patricia Arquette's actual son on the beach at the end. Oh, 
Um, and it's such a lovely moment. And he's got an eye patch because he looks like so he looks like a badass because he's got one eye. And yeah. they're just living their best life in Mexico, yeah. having got away with it all. And then the sun sets as well, reminding us that this is a fairy tale with a fairy tale ending. Really, yeah. it's it's like all Tarantino movies. They take place in the real world, but in a slightly unrealistic version of the real world. You know, where gangsters and all this sort of stuff happens. Oh, it's his, it's his, it's Tarantino's dream world when he's sitting in the movie shop, sitting and he's got no customers today, and he's sitting there just working at all the movies that he's been watching. He's gone outside around the corner because Frank, the new guy, is coming and smoked a joint. He's all right, I have a smoke a joint. If you come back in, just sat there, watch these movies go. Imagine if it was that, and he loves, he loves these movies. He goes to the cinema and, oh, there's, you know. It's interesting. Tarantino, I know a lot of people obviously do sort of have said before, plagiarism and all this sort of stuff, and he steals ideas. And yeah, he does. He gets influences, but come on, like, we're all as creatives generally. He doesn't, take he doesn't hide that. And stuff. No, he doesn't hide it. And he's putting it through his own filter. And a lot of the films you do see are done that, but not as, as blazingly. He does take certain actual ideas and scenes at times. He and homages, shots. I would say. He does. He, 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 yeah, well, that's an argument, isn't it? Um, but yeah, um, I, but I love love what it does. It, he, I, he's brought it out into the world, which we're all quite happy to see that. It's oh, it's a porn. He makes it cinema porn. Do you know what I mean? It's, he puts on visually... Well, I know it's, it's Tony Scott's film, but with Tarantino, he visually puts on that sort of cinema porn. It's the stuff that you want to see in a movie. You want to see... Uh, it's cool. Kill Bill, cool. you want to see a massive fucking fight on the staircase of all these cool. people. You know, the word is that cool. cool stuff. Yeah. He always... His movies are cool, yeah. and they're cool to watch. They're cool. The dialogue is always very cool. You can look at Tarantino and think he's very cool, though. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Um, this movie originally this is six, nine out of ten for me on IMDb. I still keep it there. Mm -hmm. I was worried about going back and watching it, probably the first time in about five or six years, because I know all the racial slurs and stuff. And I was everything seems such so much more heightened at the moment as it should be. But actually, although they are all in there, they have their place and the reasons for them being said, I think, for the most part. Maybe not the F-A-G word that's used a couple of times. But So I don't really have too much of a problem with that. I, and I think this film is it's definitely a 9 out of 10. And I think everybody brings their A-game to the table. It's not quite a film gods movie, but it is very close to being a film gods movie for me. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good movie. Um, I definitely recommend. Um, if you haven't seen it, definitely watch it. It's, it's, it's a good, fun film. Yeah, and um, it's romantic, and that's why we picked it for our Valentine's episode. It is. Um, I, I, was, I started watching it. I was like, oh, I messaged Sarah. I said, I should watch this with you. I do apologise. I would watch my Blu-ray, though. <laughs> so, I was like, no, I'm watching it at home. I want to watch, watch my Blu-ray. Blu I love you, but not as much as my Blu-ray player. Yeah, yeah thanks for that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I wasn't thinking that. Right, let's get out of here, man. Let's, let's have a let's have a little bit of a breather and come back for the outro. Okay. Again. Back again, episode 132. That was on another one of our Valentine specials. Yeah, that's the, nine we've done now. Uh, yeah, it probably is. Yeah, and uh, we actually loved both of these movies. Oh. Um, you know, very bad things held, hold up very, very well. True romance held up as always does. So great stuff. Mm. I'm really glad we picked these. Uh, we're both on the same page with both of these, really. And you know what we're going to do next year? I think you even told me, didn't you? Um. Yes, I think I did. Yeah, that's uh, what I don't right now. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, but yeah, so that was that. Uh, love, love is in the air. Love, love is love in the air. Yeah. Gav, I've got a question to ask you. Um, it's a love question. Mm. What, what is it that you love mm. about horror films? Because we've been doing a podcast for almost ten years now. What is it you love about horror films? Escapism. About horror. Escapism, I think. Is that your your main answer? No, I don't know. It's a it's a it's, that's a, it's a hard question. I don't know. There's a comfort. I, I have a, such a comfort to it. It's, not, it's 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 all of that. It's it's the comfort in going into a spooky, scary place, but knowing that it, you're not actually gonna get hurt or something. Yeah, yeah. 
So like that is the escapism, is the comfort of it. I think it's just, it's just. A, I don't know. I love the dark. I love everything on the dark side of the world. I love the other day I was driving down the road. There's so much fog, and the trees and the silhouettes. It's just all, it's all like, creepy, but it's not creepy to me. I find it all like romantic almost. The darkness and everything. I just love horror and everything. But I don't like real life horror. I know what you mean. But yeah, so I think it's I think it's a an escape and comfortability of horror. That's a good answer. Mm. You very good. Um, yeah, I think those things and also like nostalgia and as a kid, I was always drawn to the things I shouldn't. Mm. I was told I shouldn't be doing like garbage bell kids and you know and all these comic books that had violence and like judge dread and all this kind of stuff and i and then once you saw robocop at the age of like 10 i was just like yeah. i need to see more of this what is this you know and and uh, so gore is a big thing for me and not so much anymore these days unless it's practical but um yeah I, I, yeah, the same as you. I, 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 we both have a very dark sense of humour, and a lot of horror is quite funny. I think um, it, it never takes itself seriously. It's a genre that never really takes itself that seriously. Even in the most serious of horror films, there's always a moment where well, something silly happens. What it comes down to, whole muddy is death, and we all are completely interested and fascinated with death. Not that we ever want to die. Well, um, some people do. But, um, Jesus, it's getting dark. No, no, so if you're on fucking terminal life support or something, you're like, just kill me now, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it, it comes down to the, the death. And, like, that is such a fascinating thing. Is there an afterlife? You know, there's religion for death. There's everything. It's like, you know, we're only here for a very small amount of time. So, watching horror and stuff, which is based on death, because that's what it is horror. Um, even though some people, if you can look past that and think death is not horror and just death is a different thing, like, well, it's all going to happen to us. There's no point of being horrific. But I guess it's in horrific ways it's, it's done as well. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm going into something now. I'll stop this That's now. all right. No. I just I just wanted to ask you what it was that you loved about horror, yeah. um, just for our Valentine's episode. Now, before we sign out and say our goodbyes and talk about what's coming up next, got two messages that have come in um, for Valentine's. Uh, one of them, I hope she doesn't mind, is Jamie Sammons. Um, she sent, I'm not going to play your voice clip, Jamie, don't worry, but just as we were recording, you sent us a very sweet uh, and very funny voice clip of you laughing through most of it. And as you know, I'm a big fan of your laugh. Um, I've talked about this a lot. You've got one of the best laughs ever. It always cheers me up. But yeah, you sent us a lovely message just telling us how much you enjoyed our last episode uh, with Hereditary and Poltergeist. And um, you love it, especially when Gav starts talking absolute nonsense. The specific example you gave was Gav saying that he'd donate his skeleton to Necro Porn. <laughs> um, I didn't even remember that, but that sounds kind of cool. Uh, you know, oh, he's saying it not, again. Not causing like a thing to do. I mean, I can voice out. Um, and you love my response, which was my usual, which is fucking hell um so jamie we love you lots as, as as you have told us you do to us we love you so so much and also dean martin our friend our listener supporter for pretty much the whole 10 years of us doing this um says happy valentine's special much love to you both and he says true romance is one of my favorite films ever mm-hmm. and that is a good film to have up in there Absolutely. it's definitely yeah. Definitely um, gone up in my estimation after watching it for this. Thanks for the messages, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah. So, what is coming up next? Do you want to know? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, for episode 133, it will be our Women in Horror episode, um, which is the month of February. So, we will be covering The Hunt from 2020. And you're next from 2011 to badass women in the main ass kicking role, lead roles. Really interesting, quite modern films as well. Okay. Cool. So, and then episode 134 is another patron pick. We're back. Another one. I know. Well, we've been quite good to get another episode out. Uh, so, we've got to get that woman in horror this this month if we can yeah we'll get it we'll get it done in the next couple of weeks um so for patron pick it is i can reveal kevin s fife has stepped Ooh. up and he's thrown us a couple of absolute classics legacy 
from 1978. I don't even know what this is. Yeah, I've looked, and I do know it, and I have seen it a long time ago, and I do remember enjoying it, so this is going to be a fun one. And then uh, George George Scott in The Changeling from 1980. George Scott. I love The Changeling. It's like, I've said it before, it's like my favourite Haunted House movie. So, Kevin, we'll be covering your episode in a couple of episodes' time. I will, if you listen to this and you want to get your email over to me, brilliant. If not, I'll give you a little nudge nearer the time and you can get your email over as to why you pick those and what you think about them and anything else you want to say. We'll read it all out. Mm. And what's the third film uh, 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 episode? Because you normally say three, don't I you? do. Episode 135. You're not going to see this one coming. We're covering two Invisible Men films. Oh really? We're covering Hollow Man from episode two, oh, uh, episode twenty. I remember. Sorry, yes. from two thousand, and we're covering the original Invisible Man from nineteen thirty-three, which is ninety years old, which is crazy. Wow. Um. So yeah, the the original Invisible Man, yeah, which that, is that was, a very dark comedy. Well, yeah, but that was a fifteen rated, and the others are all PG. It's a very dark comedy. Um, Ghost Rangers killing people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's naked, obviously. Not that you can see it. Um, that'd be really cool. And Hollow Man with Kevin Naked Bacon. We can talk about Kevin, Kevin Bacon's naked package bacon. again. We can talk about his um, package again. Literally you will be talking about his package. I have no interest in Kevin Bacon's package. I don't know how many times I have to say this. I never knew in my life what I have to say. I have no interest in Kevin Bacon's package. It's just a shame that his, his package is invisible for most of the movie. It is. It's not a shame. It is for you. Okay. So that's what's coming up over the next couple of episodes. So before we say goodbye, let's just do the usual admin. We are the podcast on Haunted Hill. We're a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Go to legionpodcast.com to find us and all the other shows under the network. There's a lot of fun to be had there. You can email us directly at the podcast on Haunted Hill at outlook.com. Um, you can go on Facebook. You can find Legion Podcasts on there. You can also find us on there. That's where we're most active. We've got a page where we've got all our supporters, listeners, friends, patrons, etc., etc. Uh, we've been chatting for years. Join us. It's really good fun. Share what you're watching, uh, what you're looking forward to, trailers, posters, art, whatever it is, you know, share it, share it, share it. It's great, great fun on there. Yeah, um, where, wherever you're listening to us now is where you can find us in the future, but we're generally available on most podcast platforms podcast platforms like spotify youtube podknife apple podcast addict podbean um we're on twitter at haunted podcast we're on instagram that's the podcast on haunted hill insta and we talked about it earlier but let's give another plug to our star wars horror movie coming out star wars sanctuary moon um we're a third of the way through kickstarter we need another two thirds uh, to really get get it going so please share uh, the link it'll be on facebook or go to Kickstarter and search for Sanctuary Moon. I'm sure you can find it that way. <laughs> um, Easy to find, really. You don't have to donate. If you want to, though, obviously we'd love it if you did. It'd or, be brilliant. Or, or, share, or share it to your mate who loves Star Wars. Yeah, there's everybody knows somebody who loves Star Wars. So and share it, share it, share it. We're like working our asses off on this. And obviously it's non-profit. We're not getting anything for it. And eventually it's just gone on YouTube. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> um, and that... And that's through Deadbolt Films, which is our production company, um, which is probably almost 10 years old itself now. Well, um, it's older than 10 years old. I set it up. I filmed Shadow Death. Oh, God, it's about 12 ago, years so old. It's about 12 years old. Yeah. Uh, and so you can find out more on deadboltfilms.com. That's where you can find out about our show, Gav's other show. Uh, the High Strangers podcast with my dearest Sarah, where we talk about uh, spooky and horror. True love shit. Hot- some comics we've produced um our short films our feature films mm. uh, and there's merchandise on there as well um and then there's deadbolt films is on youtube there's a youtube channel just search for that mm. uh, we're on instagram it's just deadbolt films and we're on twitter which is just at deadbolt films um just a quick plug as well as mentioned earlier i do a show with my buddy rj mccready called our buddy rj mccready called blame it on the aliens podcast we're on a hiatus at the moment but we are coming back very soon with our 10th episode um so that'll be exciting we're talking about aliens and alien abductions <laughs> um and finally patron thank you so much as always to our patrons if you want to become a patron you don't have to but if you want to and you want to donate as little as a pound a month a dollar a month you can just go to patron and search for the podcast on haunted hill or ask me message me on facebook or email 
and if you become a patron not only will you get a free t-shirt of one of three colors in your size or any size you want um you will also get the chance to be a patron and have a patron pick where you pick the two movies we cover for an episode and you tell us why you want us to cover them and we'll go in all in on those two movies for you uh and we're doing it in rotation we've had five patrons now um so at some point we're going to be coming looping back around um in fact one of our patrons matthew who is the one that, the reason we do patron pick matthew shout out to you um the reason we do it and matthew's already selected his two films for when it comes back around to him again so we're very excited about that <laughs> yeah keen. he's really really keen and i'm very mm. excited for the films he selected but that's a long way off so We'll get to those um but yeah go to patreon do all that business if you want to we'd love it but we really appreciate our patrons don't we, we Gav? thank you uh we love you guys so much especially we love you on valentine's the old valentine's hearts coming um, your yeah, way no, we really appreciate it it means the world to us and we we love just doing this anyway but it's just so much special that you uh think, funny enough think that of us. you said to me just before we press record at the very beginning you said i just love doing this shit man yeah, I and it's true. That. I, yeah, I've been working all day. I'm tired right now. I'm sitting there, my back's aching, but I'm enjoying talking. Yeah, to you. hanging out with you. Um, so, as always, naming our patrons. Uh, thank you ever so much to Don Collier, Matthew Godley, Jamie Jenkins, Kevin S. Fife, Sarah K, Rachel, R. Jamie Creedy, and Lex Boo. Guys, love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. So that is it, Gav. That was our Valentine's episode. Another one done for the year. Um, so. It's, I guess it's instead of good nights, we're going to do lots of love. So I guess it's going to be a lots of love from Elliot getting a blowjob in his car with cocaine all over his face. I guess so. Uh, it's, it's love to uh, Floyd just uh, sitting there having, <laughs> having, his, having his little romantic bong to him. So I imagine on Valentine's he just sits there and says, Don't need fucking women, man. We've got you having our weed. <laughs> you know. Fucking kill you, man. So it's a love to, to, to uh, Drexel. Drexie, oh, oh god sexy Drexy. yeah and it's uh lots of love to uh mar from home alone getting plowed into his minivan by his own brother that's not good not good at all yeah. and it's lots of love to the three-legged dog yeah and it's a lot of love to you listeners thank you and a lot, and a lot of love to you gav oh a lot of love to you okay well guys thank you ever so much for joining us as always and supporting us and listening to us and just being with us and uh, we'll be back for episode 133 absolutely and we can't wait to uh, plug your holes with audible loveliness again stay safe guys and remember if you find a suitcase full of cocaine snort it <laughs> whoa <laughs> bye bye thank you for listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill we will be back again real soon